Good evening. This is a call to order. Special meeting of the Governing Board of Education is called to order by Dr. Joseph Komorowski at 4 o'clock p.m. on Tuesday, February 14, 2023 at the District Office Conference Center, rooms A through C. Happy Valentine's Day. B, approval of the agenda. Are there any requests for changes to the agenda? I'll take a motion and a second to approve the agenda as presented. Move. Moved by Mr. Schwartz, second. seconded by Mr. Gonzalez. All in favor say aye. 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 Motion adopted 5-0. Uh, open session. Um, we have attendance, governing board, Dr. Joseph Komorowski, president, Mrs. Jennifer Wirst mcclerk Mrs. Allison Barclay, Mr. Danny Gonzalez, and Mr. Stephen Schwartz. Secretary of the board, Dr. Jody McClay, superintendent, Mrs. Nicole Lash, assistant superintendent, business support services, Ms. Kimberly Velez, assistant superintendent, educational support services, Mr. Frank Arce, assistant superintendent, human resources development, Ms. Nicole Deus, Assistant Superintendent, Student Support Services. Mrs. Lene Anakabar, Executive Assistant to the Superintendent. And if we can all rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. If you have a hat on, kindly place it over your heart. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice. Public comments. Public comment is restricted to only items listed on the special meeting agenda. All comments will be limited to three minutes in the order received to a maximum total time of 30 minutes. Unless the items have been placed on the published agenda in accordance with the Brown Act, there should be no action taken. No discussion will be made regarding personal issues in open session. All public comments are an important part of the board meeting and are given careful consideration by the governing board. We have one public comment tonight. This is Janae Schwarf. Jenny. Jenny. <laughs> oh, yeah. There is a mic. <laughs> Can I just use my teacher voice? Oh, you can't. Okay. Oh, God. <laughs> all right. So, getting text. So, today's meeting is all about team building and trust. Dr. McClay is offering you all an opportunity here, and I hope that you take advantage of it by truly listening and learning. You three new board members had an opportunity to build trust with the teachers and students of TVUSD when you joined the board by visiting classrooms, speaking with teachers, getting to know the schools in your trustee areas. But instead, you decided to use your newfound positions to erode any possibility of teaming up with teachers and staff when you not only lied in your campaigns accusing us of teaching sex and racism to our students, but by also voting to ban the teaching of true history before ever stepping on to a campus. So we do not trust you. Since you created this crucible of animus and distrust, it is incumbent on you to fix it. Stop focusing on the Seven Mountains mandate. We are not a religious organization. Stop focusing on following extremist views that have nothing to do with what happens in TV USD classrooms. We are not a political or organization. Your actions have sown nothing but division and derision in this valley, and we do not trust you. Jen, a couple of ways you can build trust with your constituents, one of which I am, is to one, stop saying you talk to hundreds and thousands of people and waving papers around. You did not knock on my door nor my best friend's door. You door knocked on your own echo chamber, so you fed your own biases. Start building trust by listening to your whole team, all of the parents and students you're supposed to represent if you truly want to build trust, because we do not trust you. The second way that you can build trust is by publicly denouncing Chauncey Killens. He has been terrorizing students as young as five in front of schools across the district for the past year, and yet he campaigned for you. At the last meeting, he harassed students by not listening when they asked him to leave them alone, and he declared that a student and teacher should be lynched. As long as you stay silent, actually, as long as any of you stay silent, you are complicit, and we will not trust you. 
As long as you continue to make these meetings about your agendas instead of what is good for this community and its most important members, the students, we will not trust you. The three new board members have quite a bit of work to do to earn the trust of the people, so I encourage you to get to it. Thank you. Now we're on to the board workshop continuation of board member ongoing, and I will hand it over to Thank Dr. You. McClay. Thank you. So I'm actually very excited tonight to have the opportunity to bring our board together. It's relatively common, as, especially when you have new board members, to come together and to work on some team building, some trust building, um, really with the ultimate goal of eventually uniting around a common purpose. What is it that we as a collective team want to accomplish in our school district? So I'm excited this evening to have two amazing, amazing retired educators to facilitate this workshop. They are consultants from Leadership and Associates. We have Dr. Michael Lynn, Dr. Sandy Lyon, and I'm I'm going to turn it over to them in the hopes that we can really get to the meat of it and without listening to me talk too much. Okay, we're good. Thank you. A little out of practice. Okay. Well, good afternoon. We're really glad to be here. I'm Sandy Lyon. Um, we're going to introduce ourselves and talk a little bit about the purpose here. Uh, but before we do that, I just wanted to commend all of you for being here this afternoon to do this work. This is foundational. We're going to talk about it in a minute, what we know from research and the literature around the importance of trust and trust building to create a smart and healthy organization, which is what we all want for our school districts because we know smart, healthy organizations best serve their students and the communities in which they live. So we're very excited to take you through that. We're going to be the facilitators. Um, our goal, we will talk a little. We're educators after all, so you will hear um, some of the content. But really what today is is a structured conversation with some background material, some information, with the sole goal of allowing you as board members, as newly elected officials, and your cabinet and your superintendent to have the opportunity to get to know each other. Um, I can tell you that you never do this naturally at the dais, right? It just doesn't happen where we have that kind of formal conversation where we talk a little bit about who we are, where we came from, and how we came to be in the seats we're in today. So that's gonna be one of the foundational things that we're going to do. Just have a little more insight into, we all have surface pieces, we'll talk later about the shift from a campaign mindset to a governance mindset, but we all have a background, we have experiences that's important for us to get an opportunity to share. The regularly scheduled board meeting is not the place for that. So you're crafting time so that you get to do that. And what we know is the better we know each other, the more we understand what's happening in that discussion, the more trust we build, the more honest we can be, and the more we may not agree. And we're, ne we're not gonna here to say you're gonna all have unanimity around all the issues that you face. But what we hope is building that foundation of trust that there's a better opportunity for us to come into those discussions with our eyes wide open. And as I used to tell my cabinet, listening as if our minds can be changed. Um, because that kind of dispositional <coughs> listening gets to a different conversation than if we're already set with where we're headed. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about myself and I have my colleague here. Um, jump in. Uh, Sandy Lyon, longtime superintendent. I, uh, 13 years in the seat. I was superintendent principal of a one school district in Northern California, where I like to say I did everything but drive the bus. I did not have the appropriate licensing for that. Mm -hmm. um, and then I spent five years in Santa Monica, Malibu, and retired from Palm Springs Unified. Um, teacher, you know, principal, that traditional route, middle school person in my heart. Spent a lot of time as a teacher principal at the middle school level. Um, my husband's retired was re, is a retired teacher. He spent 24 years teaching high school. Second career guy went back. I have two grown sons. My um, oldest is an attorney, married to a wonderful young woman, and my um, youngest is also a second career teacher, and he's in his first year teaching sixth grade. So it's been a great year for me to just kind of be grounded to what it feels like once again to be that first year person in a classroom. So I'm glad I have that perspective now as well. Um, and we're gonna get into a little more sharing, so I'm gonna leave it at that right now, but I know you wanna know who are these people and why are they here, and so we do a lot of this kind of work. Um, Ms. Wurzma asked earlier if we did it you know, regularly. This is the season for board governance workshops, so we're pretty busy right now, and again, commend you all for being here today. Thank you, Sandy, and thank you all. I wanna begin by thanking everyone um, today, and, and 
and Joe, to your leadership, and the board, I think your wisdom, and, and the understanding, building trust, you're gonna hear the same trust that word quite a bit, because that's the reason why we're here. But we are facilitators, we have a curriculum, um, we, that's as far as we can take you. And the outcome of t tonight uh, is truly up to you, individually, and open your heart, um, open your mind, and to keep one thing in mind, I got to know some of the uh, newly elected board members, and quite honestly, everyone, Joe didn't get an opportunity um, to talk to you earlier, you were getting ready to start a meeting, but I wanted to say um, congratulations to you as a unit. You guys are together. Temecula Valley, I don't have to tell you, um, before I get into my background, I came out of Corona Norco Unified School District. I was there for 13 years as a superintendent from nine. But you know, uh, one of the district often, a lot of the district look up to for innovation, and we have, you know, 24 school, dis uh, school district in the county. We all do great things, but um, a lot of folks look up to you for modeling and for good work, and a lot of it for leadership and unity. Uh, your community is depending on you uh, to serve the children together. So we're excited here to, to help you and trying to get that um, on track and continue to move forward as a unity. Um, it's a fun thing to do, and we're just blessed to have the opportunity to do that. With that said, um, as Sandy, um, I've been a superintendent for, with Corona Norco for nine years. Uh, my uh, 30 years in education, actually, I only taught three years. That was not the intent, believe me. I wanted to coach, and so I left engineering and went into uh, the teaching and coaching, actually. And Danny and I were just talking about sports quite a bit. Uh, and just one thing leads to the other. Um, I ended up going to administration pretty quickly in eight different school districts. And 15 of those 13, uh, 30 years, believe it or not, human resources. Mm -hmm. So that's why I consider my background in, um, in public education. I've learned a lot. And uh, so uh, that's kind of what brought me here. And uh, just uh, thank you, Sandy, for the opportunity. And thank you all uh, for having us. Looking forward to it. All right. So we're going to, I'm going to have Renee put that up for us. We'll have some slides. And I think everyone can see them regardless of where you are. Um, if you could go to the next slide, we'll just do a quick overview of the day. So um, as a good friend of ours, Carolyn Boehner always says, a good agenda is there just in case you don't have something else to talk about. Um, we are very comfortable if, and, and that's not for your regular board meetings. <laughs> that's for this kind of a meeting. Um, we're very comfortable, depending on where the conversation goes, in not covering all of the material. We're mindful of your time as well. We have a series of things we hope to get through, but I just want you to know that um, this isn't that kind of workshop where we need to be rigid and adhere to a time schedule. Um, before we start, the other thing is just uh, breaks. I'll take a dipstick check a little bit later and see if we need to take a quick break. Sitting, as we know, is the new smoking, and we all sit way too much, so if we can move around, we will try to do that. So what we have today is we've, we're going to do a few more uh, welcome and introductions. The introductions part for you all is embedded in the next session, section where we're going to just tell a little bit more about ourselves than we would normally reveal in just a, a coffee somewhere. Um, and we're going to do a little leadership yoga, and we're going to ask everybody to participate in really thinking and reflecting on um, what they really want to accomplish this year, what they're thinking about as they look toward the rest of this year for 22-23. Uh, and then uh, we'll talk a little bit about the smart and healthy organization work, the uh, Lencioni work, and how it pertains to organizations writ large, but certainly to public school institutions as well. And then we have um, a reading, the four traits of governance team mindset, but snuck in there, it's not on the agenda, but Mike and I have been uh, talking over the last few days, and one of the things that he had just done and was successful somewhere else, we always, you know, good, good teachers and educators, we borrow, we don't steal, we borrow each other's work. And so he just did this with a, another uh, school district in Southern California. And it, it, it's something that um, has been around for almost 20 years, The Speed of Trust by Stephen Covey, good work. And so there's a piece there we want to sneak in. And then we have a short reading and then hope to leave with a metaphor. Um, for all of us to think, because the brain anchors differently to a metaphor than it does to literal interpretation. So sometimes it's nice to have a big picture thing that we can think about as we go forward in the work. Any questions about that? Sound okay? Mm -hmm. And I'm really glad we have um, the whole team here because I think it's really important. Mike and I talked about this before. Um, and so thank you, Jody, for having your, your whole team here. Um, one of the things that you, you all rely on each other as staff and board to have good discussions, to have the background, to have the information. And I go back to what we talked about at the beginning, having those underpinnings of relationship beyond just 
we know people, and then you know we've all been in that setting where you you've known somebody for five years, seven years, and something's revealed that you're like, I never knew that about you, um, and it gives you great insight. So we're hoping to bubble up a few of those things today in this meeting, so you have some of those underpinnings as we move forward. What we wanted to show you, though, as we start, was this graphic because, um, as Simon Sinek always tells us, we want to start with the why people. We always like to get to the what and the how, but the why is really important. Why are we doing this? Um, in his book, Patrick Lencioni really looks at, and it's not, not framed positively, it's the five dysfunctions of a team. So you see the negative on the right side. But what it really shows is that um, what you need to be to be a functional team. And so if you look at the bottom of the pyramid, what, what really starts a, a team out on the wrong foot is that absence of trust. If that's not there, the rest of the pyramid um, is gonna have a lot of structural issues. So absence of trust, fear of conflict, lack of commitment, avoidance of accountability, and then ultimately what that leads to is an inattention to results. When we're focused, we're unable to focus because we're focused on all the discontent um, that we have in the organization. We don't get to where we're really trying to. And so on the left in blue, the cohesive team, which is trust, conflict, commitment, accountability, and results. Trust is foundational, and it doesn't happen overnight. There's a speed of trust, which we've talked about and alluded to, um, and certain action steps and dispositions have to be in place in order for that to happen. Did you want to add anything? No, we're, we're good and ready to transition, okay. um, if we like. So the next um, slide um, is really an activity, as Sandy had talked about earlier, about just, again, the word trust, and I said that earlier, too. We're going to be hearing that quite a bit uh, today, and the reason uh, why we're, we're here. Um, it requires a commitment, too. You know, when, when you are building trust, if you give trust and you don't receive trust, that's not gonna go very far. So we're asking everyone to commit. And how do you commit? Well, we're gonna do something that's kind of fun. Um, add this next slide, you look up, or on your PowerPoint presentation. Nope, um, you were right. Oh, good. Yep, we're, go we back. Were, yeah. yep, perfect. Is we're gonna do a little bit kind of an icebreaker, so to speak, right? And, and, and I'll even begin by modeling. You guys met me for the first time for the most part. Um, but really for each other to have an opportunity to go just a little bit deeper. If you remember that triangle in the earlier slide, uh, I think the word next to lack of trust is invulnerability, right? Um, and um, vulnerability is required. Uh, and so uh, I'm asking all of you as participants um, this evening, as we go through the exercise. And to keep that in mind, because I want you, Sandy and I, we want you to take away as much as possible of the reason why we're here today. Um, after all, on a Valentine's <laughs> evening, uh, I wanna make sure that the time's worth our uh, while. And, and, and so I'll, I'll begin, there are three questions, and then keeping my, again, a little bit of vulnerability um, to get to know a little bit uh, of one another, to go a little bit deeper. And so there are three questions. Um, pretty, pretty quickly we'll go through, and I'll go through them. Where, um, uh, was I born um, in also the place of birth of order, right? So for me, I'll reverse that a little bit. I am the oldest of the three. Uh, I have a younger brother and a younger sister. I was born actually and raised in Taiwan. Um, I came to this country when I was 13. And people ask why. I'm telling you right now, there's no other reason why from a middle family, uh, class family from Taiwan where parent, parents will give up everything and say, we're gonna move the family to this other side of the earth. Mm -hmm. What? Right? Well, my dad, for whatever reason, thought the best opportunity for my kids is actually on this other side of this earth, a place called the United States of America. And why? Because abundance of opportunity, especially the education system. Now, where did he get that? I don't understand. Uh, to this day, I need to ask him, actually. Um, but we came. And it is because the public education, we're beneficiaries, my family. Uh, my sister's a teacher. 25 years in the making. She teaches special education in eighth grade. The toughest job, in my humble opinion, um, that you can have, but she's doing that for a long time. She loves it. She loves her kids. Um, I just recently transitioned from uh, working full-time into part-time now, um, doing this work, and it's been a blessing for me. My brother's a physician. None of that would happen. None of that would happen. It wasn't for the opportunity I was afforded to me and my family here in America, so we're very, very blessed um, with that and where I grew up and went to school. When we immigrated to the United States, um, my parents worked in a factory, and there was an aerospace factory called Aerojet. I don't know if you guys are familiar. It's in the Azusa area. So we, uh, we, uh, we grew up in Azusa. Went to all the uh, elementary. I was there for one year, 
and uh, I was actually put back because of my language barrier. Um, and then graduated from Mississauga High School, so I'm a local in the San Gabriel Valley. And so obviously the significant challenge I had to face is really coming in at the age of 13. I knew no English um, but sports, Danny. Got me through. It, it gave me confidence. I made a lot of friends. And so um, and here I am today with you fine folks this evening. So that's an example of going a little bit deeper. Uh, you don't have to go as lengthy as, as I, um, but to the extent that you're comfortable. Okay. So I'm going to say uh, we're going to begin with, uh, if it's okay, Danny, my partner over here. You just know it, right? <laughs> did, I, I know it's going to be. How did I know you? Uh, right? yes. You know me, Danny, yeah. You're going to let me lead the charge here. There you All go. right. Um, I'll do my best. Uh, so where I was born, uh, my place of birth, or my place in the birth order. Uh, so I was actually born at uh, Long Beach uh, Long Beach Naval Hospital. Uh, my father was a, a career military man and was actually still stationed in uh, Germany when my mom uh, went into labor with me. And it's since been torn down so it no longer exists. Um, I am the uh, middle child um, of three boys. Uh, my older brother, Joe, and my younger brother, Gabriel, um, all biblical names. <laughs> <laughs> Thank my mother for that. Um, I grew up in uh, mainly in Garden Grove, uh, Garden Grove, California. I went to uh, Rancho uh, High School. Well, I went to Rancho Alamitos Middle School and then Rancho High School. And oh man, this last one's hard. So significant <laughs> challenge I had growing up. So I guess I'll I'll, I'll couple those two together because kind of where I went to school. Um, and the significant challenges that I faced. My, my, my entire childhood was, uh, was a challenge. Um, I did not have a great childhood. Um, it was very traumatic for a lot of different reasons. Um, I've shared this with a couple of you, a little bit about my, my background and my story, but um, at, at 15 years old, my, my uh, sophomore year in high school, um, I actually attended that year of high school uh, in jail. I was a, a, a ward of the uh, California Youth Authority. Um, I found myself uh, addicted to methamphetamines. And um, like we shared, um, it was actually my love of soccer that helped to kind of pull me out of that. And I focused on uh, sports and, um, and then later on in my life, uh, my relationship with, uh, with my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ that pulled me out of that. Um, but I think it was really impactful because it kind of pushed me towards where I'm sitting today because um, I was one of those kids that was left behind, you know, at, at a young age. And so um, to be able to, to work towards and give back and share some of my experience, my story, and how I overcome some of that, I think was, was really important. So. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Being vulnerable. Thanks, Dan. Yeah. No. <laughs> yeah. Literally, I got nothing. I'm super boring. Um, <clears throat> so I was born in Charlotte, North Carolina. My mom's whole family is from the South. So really, if I go to the South, I go right back into the Southern accent. Um, I grew up in, oh wait, birth order. So I'm the baby, which most people are not surprised that I'm the baby, but um, I was, I called it a mistake. My mother lovingly called me a surprise. I was 10 years after my closest sibling. So my brother was 14, I had a sister who was 11, a sister who was 10, and then me came in and spoiled the family for, for the rest of them. Um, so I grew up in Northern Virginia, right outside of DC. My dad was a contractor with the government. He worked at the Pentagon for many years. Um, and then when I was in the middle of high school, which is probably my significant challenge, we moved out here to Escondido. So I finished high school in Escondido. And that was probably the hardest thing that I went through was switching from where I was born. And back then, you know, no internet, no, no Instagram. It was like paper letters with my best friends I'd had since kindergarten. So that was a really big challenge for me. Um, and then I did the exact same thing to my kids and moved them very far away from their friends in the middle of high school back out here. Um, after I graduated from high school, I went to college in Utah and then met my husband there, got married, had all our kids there, and every single day wished I didn't live there, wished I lived in Southern California, and 10 years ago, my dream came true, and um, I got a job down here, and so moved the family right in the middle of high school for all my kids, which 
I don't know, they might be listening. I don't know if they'd say they thought that was a good thing or not, but um, yeah, so that's about me. I've already shared <clears throat> this story with Joe and Danny in uh, conversation, so I'll try not to be too boring again. <clears throat> I was born in the Bronx, uh, in the middle child, older brother, younger sister, who much like Allison was, oops, we were all, my brother and I were nine and 13 when my sister was born. Um, I was able to get into school early because of when I was born. So I was always the youngest in my class. <clears throat> and I followed my brother through school and then my sister followed me, which was really bad for her because my brother was a great student and I was a good student and my sister was. Yeah. Um, I skipped a grade in elementary school and then I skipped a grade the way they did it in New York. I skipped fifth grade and I skipped eighth grade. So uh, I graduated high school, I was 16. Uh, my wife and I met when we were in high school. We dated through high school and we've been married 55 years. Uh, I got my bachelor's degree I, at 20. I started teaching uh, that September. I got my master's degree in education and then my sixth year certificate in supervision. Um, I taught 35 years in New York City. When I retired in 2002, uh, we stayed in New York for a couple of years, then we moved here. Uh, my son and my daughter both live here. I have a son who's an attorney and two grandsons, and my daughter lives in Temecula. And my biggest si significant challenge growing up was I was always the youngest. Mm -hmm. No matter where I was, whether it was elementary school or college or taking the teaching exam or starting to work. I was always the youngest, um, and that was uh, a big deal for me. So I was born in St. Louis, Missouri. That's what my family will tell me, and I don't remember much about it. We moved out to San Diego when, I think I was four or five, my dad got a job with General Dynamics. So I consider myself a California girl. Um, so grateful to have loving parents. I'm the firstborn, so a little bit more type A, you could say, and I have an amazing sister. My mom and sister have both been in education for years. My mom was a middle school teacher. Her heart is with those kids, and I just saw how much she gave and how much she mentored them. Um, I went to school in a variety of places. I went to a regular public school, I attended a Christian school, and then we were homeschooled in middle school and it was largely because I was a gymnast at the time and just thought I was gonna make the Olympic team. <laughs> so I've always been a big dreamer. My mom will tell you, I turned circles hoping I would turn into Wonder Woman and had my rope to make people tell the truth. Mm -hmm. I wanted to be a Barker's beauty and I'd walk around the house and model furniture and make a fool of myself. But I did tell that story later at the Price is Right show and got on and kissed Bob Barker on the cheek and won $10,000. <laughs> so dreams can come true on different levels. And um, anyway, so uh, I had a great education. Um, I went to Christian Heritage College after graduating from Tri-City Christian High School. So again, I did the full gamut was thankful for my homeschooling years as well. And I think this really plays well for me in being a trustee because choice is wonderful and we have that here within the district. So I can understand folks who are looking at charters or some of the different options that we have, I can speak to that. And I absolutely love this community. I've been here for 17 years. A significant challenge I had is I blew out my knee when I was 15 years old in gymnastics, in a gymnastics meet. I was vaulting, so ran down the runway, twisted, landed, the mat moved, and I snapped everything. Landed on the mat, my dad came running down the stairs, fainted dead away. We thought he was having a heart attack and I was crippled. <laughs> so from that point, I kind of saw the dream of all things gymnastics die, which was fine. I went through three surgeries, had a huge brace for a year, and then segued into cheerleading and tumbled with a huge brace because I am that person who's always determined if a door shuts, God's gonna open another one and you're gonna go through with purpose. So I'm just thankful my parents got me through that. Um, when I got married, I met my husband oh, probably three or four years after college, had three kids in three years, that was a crazy time. Any of you that are mamas, you know, it's, it's nuts and I love them 
to pieces. They're 18, 19, and 21. I have such joy in each one of them. They're not perfect kids, but they're amazing. And they've gone through our schools here. And so I think that's brought me here knowing I'm on the other end, somewhat an empty nester. I have one senior left. And so this was where I thought I could pour a lot of my experience and my heart and appreciation for the community. And my kids could say, you will not be on my back. You'll be too busy working and doing school board. And then they're grown and flown and, and just headed that way. And I'm just grateful really for all that, that God has done and hope that over the next few years, I can convince teachers and parents and people that don't necessarily see who we are now that, we, that I have a lot to give. So thank you for facilitating this tonight and hopefully we'll all walk away as different people, so. Thank you. Oh, um, pretty complicated here. Well, I was born in St. Joseph's Hospital in Wiesbaden, Germany. My mom's full German. My dad got out of Vietnam and met her. She lived at a, above a restaurant, a guest house. Um, I'm a firstborn son and let me see here, yes, where I grew up. Hmm. So I went to seven different schools, K through eight, all around the world, and then four different high schools. Let me see if I can remember them. Colorado, Alaska, Texas, North Carolina, California, Kansas, Germany, that's K through eight. Then high schools, um, Panama, East LA, Sure High School, during the Panamanian War, we had to get pushed out while my dad um, served a hardship tour down there. Um, and then I went to, uh, sorry, back to Germany and then New York. So tying that in, um, one of my good friends that I, uh, through all that, one of my hobbies, I, I love skateboarding in high school. So I was telling um, Steve that one of my good friends in high school is a pastor in the Bronx, where he's from. I just gotta find the street that his church is on. I, I keep on forgetting to do that. Um, and then tying this in, um, uh, Danny said he loved soccer growing up. Um, I didn't play growing up, and I was all, I'm like, Mom, why didn't you teach me soccer? She's like, well, because I married your American dad, and I didn't think you would enjoy it. I'm like, T so all I love is soccer. Um, and um, true story, me and Danny played on the same team, scored a goal each in 20 minutes. Bird's all part. <laughs> <Wow>. um, <clears throat> yes, and so you might say diversity is my middle name as far as I've been around the world as a military brat, um, and then I was in the military myself. Um, one of the things, uh, one of the struggles I had growing up was um, I didn't have a hometown. They're like, where are you from? <laughs> I don't know how to answer that. <laughs> um, and I had vision problems. I was born cross-sided. This is hilarious. My sister can attend to this. But if you saw me before I was five and a picture smiling, one eye is looking at that wall, one eye is looking at you. And so I had two eye operations to fix that. My dad said, you got to wear these glasses, Joseph. And I'm like, no, I don't want to wear them, Daddy, because I had a band around my head. And he kept on trying to pressure me to wear them. And I was a little kid and I, I took a huge boulder and I smashed him in the, um, in the kitchen sink. And I said, I'm not wearing these. And my dad's like, okay, you're not wearing them. And then my vision went, went perfect. So um, that not having a hometown. And I think, um, yes, that about covers me. Yeah, for now. Okay, all right, I'll go quickly. Um, where I was born, Long Beach, California. Mom and dad were junior high sweethearts. Um, I was the firstborn of three. Um, very much the type A of the family. When my sisters come over, and if they're watching tonight, I hope they're laughing. Uh, they like to mess with me by mixing up the pencils in the junk drawer because they all need to face the same way in my house. Um, <laughs> give you a little insight into how I'm wired. Um, I grew up in Westminster. A uh, little city right there near Midway City, Fountain Valley, Garden Grove, um, Huntington Beach. I went to school there, K-12, uh, Starview Elementary, Vista View Middle School, and then over to Marina High School. Um, a significant challenge, this one is hard for me because I, I recognize and I'm so thankful that I, I feel like I've been very, very blessed. Oh, incredible family, loving parents and grandparents and everybody. I mean, we still do Sunday dinner as a big extended family every week and, and have for my entire life. It was really important to my parents. My dad uh, called himself an army brat having moved around and gone to you know a couple dozen schools. So when he and mom married, they said we're gonna buy a house and we're gonna raise our family here and never leave. And so they spent almost 40 years in that first house. And so I recognize I was very, very blessed. If I had to pick a significant challenge, um, it would be connecting to school. 
Uh, school was a means to an end for me. I was a dancer and couldn't wait for the bell to ring and get to the dance studio. That's what I cared about. And I, I, I never really felt connected to school. And I think that's part of my why today and why I'm so proud of what we do is walking into every classroom and seeing how that's no longer the case. It, it's not an eight to three where kids go through the motions and do page 12 today because they did page 12, 11 yesterday. It, we truly connect kids and, and hook them on school and, and the people that are there who love them so much. So while it was a challenge, I think I've kind of flipped it into why we do what we do or why I do what I do. Uh, well, I started as ballet, uh, ballet, tap, and jazz, and then went like musical theater. So. Okay, I actually know my team here quite well, and I might actually be the only one at the table. I'm actually an only child. Um, I have no siblings, um, and what's interesting about that is I have one son, so he's an only child. <laughs> um, but I was born and raised in the Phoenix Scottsdale area. Um, and moved actually to Tucson to go to the University of Arizona. And moving from Phoenix to Tucson, I thought I was getting away from home. It's literally <laughs> 65 miles down the road. Um, but I went to the University of Arizona, graduated from my bachelor's and my master's, and actually will have my doctorate degree in the next month from the University of Arizona too. So I will complete that. So yes, thank you. Um, it's been a journey. Um, it's actually where I met my husband. Um, we'll be celebrating 30 years come this June, which is, is quite a blessing. Um, I have, as I said, one son who graduated from Chaparral High School here, um, went through our system here in Temecula Valley until he graduated and is now currently a naval pilot. Um, and he's living life in Italy right now, so life is good for him. Um, I would say my significant challenge growing up I went to pri a private Christian school from probably preschool till about sixth grade. My parents divorced in sixth grade when I was in sixth grade, and I needed to transition at that time to public school. I mean, anybody, we've all been in middle school at one point. It's a hard time to transition, and many of those kids already had a friend network, and I came into a middle school in about seventh grade and really struggled with that. And I'm, my team knows I'm a very social person. I always have been but came into a really hard time in middle school with no real friends, no connections, at the same time dealing with a, a, my parents divorcing. Um, but again, I worked through that. High school was not necessarily my favorite time. Um, it, was, it was tough um, because again, I didn't have necessarily those, those friend networks, but I, had, I was involved in golf and I was involved in softball and those, those things kept me extremely busy. Um, but again, feeling very blessed um, for my journey through all of that. And um, yeah, and I think that's my, my story. I was born in St. Jude's Hospital in Orange County, Fullerton. Um, I'm the middle of three daughters, no sons, um, and my mom is one of four and three daughters, one son. There's a lot of females in my, in my uh, family, and um, my mom was, grew up in Orange County. My grandmother grew up in Orange County. Her mother grew up in Orange County, so we were a very much Southern California-based family. Um, but my younger sister was born chronic asthmatic and the doctor said after they resuscitated her multiple times in her first year of life, you gotta get out of the city. So I found myself in Temecula in middle school, made that transition, um, and spent the rest of my time here. I am from an era and a, a working class family, if you will, so it was the college isn't for everyone kind of mentality when I was growing up. And so I am proud to say I'm the first one to graduate college on either side of my family. My dad is born in Mexico. And so my grandparents don't speak English, and, but he moved to Southern California and that's where he met my mom in high school. Um, but again, my parents, my mother was married to kids and divorced by 19. So um, talk about challenges growing up, twofold. One, moving to, in Orange County when I was there in Anaheim, everyone kind of looked like me. And I moved to Temecula and I was very much fish out of water. Um, and finding where I fit in, my mom is blonde hair, blue eyes, looks like she could be a Brady Bunch kid. My dad, as I mentioned, first language Spanish, um, born in Mexico. So kind of feeling like where do I fit in and who are my people was 
challenging elementary and middle school and being raised in an apartment you know didn't it is complicated also no front yard no backyard most of my my life but then i i hit my stride in high school thank goodness uh found some some friends and um I twirled baton, which if you've ever met any of my family, they love to tell people <laughs> and would like to encourage me at 42 years old to attempt to still do it <laughs> for anybody who will watch. <laughs> so, um, but it, it, that, that really gave me purpose though is, you know, I just, I got a job. I started commuting down to Palomar, ended up transferring to Cal State San Marcos and ended up figuring out actually college could be for everyone. Um, it, you don't have to be a certain set type of person in order to uh, find success. So I moved to San Diego and then LA after um, college and I got just found myself, uh, I'm a CPA and so I found myself auditing school districts of all things. Mm -hmm. Actually San Gabriel Valley, I was in Alhambra Unified for a while and I said if a position ever opens up in Temecula Valley Unified, I will make my way back there. That is my dream because this is the uh, district that um, I'm a product of, and sure enough, my position became available. I left LA County, and now I'm here. So I grew up here, I graduated here, I work here, and I have two little girls. They're a TK and second grader now who are also in this school system, so. So some similarities thread throughout, which is really interesting to learn. Um, I was born in Tucson, Arizona. Um, Yes, uh, my dad was in medical school there and my mom was a nurse, and, um, but they had already met in second grade, so they knew each other <laughs> that whole time. But um, I am the oldest of five children, um, but my, it's two girls and three boys. <clears throat> my dad always said that we're lucky he had the two girls first because if it had been reversed, they probably would have stopped at the three boys. <laughs> um, but I'm lucky because my sister and I are only 13 months apart. So we really shared that role of being the oldest. Um, she definitely uh, fulfills that as well. Um, so we kind of shared the oldest role together with our younger brothers. Um, when my dad got a position um, and as a pediatrician in Oceanside, we moved when I was four. Um, and I grew up in Southern California in San Diego County. And so I attended school there, um, elementary, middle, high school. Actually met my husband in seventh grade um, at our school. And uh, so had the opportunity to really grow up, even though we had a couple places we lived, um, but with a steady group of friends, um, many of who I'm still best friends with, you know, people I met in first grade. Um, and a significant challenge that I had growing up, well, I, I, I loved school, obviously, I never left. Um, <laughs> I've been in education pretty much uh, from the time I left high school, even in my college years, just volunteering and working at different schools. I came home from kindergarten um, my first day and told my mom I knew I was gonna be a teacher mm -hmm. um, because of how much I just fell in love with school the very first day. Um, so I've had a lot of blessings in my life growing up. And I've also had, you know, your, your typical um, experiences with grief and trauma in different ways that we grow up. But a significant challenge that I had growing up was um, helping people understand in my desire to work with others and represent others and uh, speak on behalf of others and lead that my um, decision for optimism was sometimes misunderstood for also being naive mm. and not understanding what other people were going through, even though I felt very passionate about working with others who were in need. Mm. And so it's always been um, just kind of looking back a challenge of mine to say, no, I can speak, I can be a part of this too. And uh, just my choice for that being, um, kind of turned me into this optimistic realist where I have a, a good foundation and grounding in reality, but just choosing that optimism um, and the outside that things can be better, you know, and we can always innovate to do that. And so that was always, I felt like I always had to stand my ground as a significant challenge growing up to say, no, I, I can do this too, even though it may not appear that I can because I have a smile on my face over here. Um, so it helped me really in my roles that I've been able to fulfill in my future too. So on to you, Frank. All right. So I was born in a place in Mexico um, called Mexicali, Baja California. The state is Baja California. And it's actually a border city near Imperial Valley. 
Um, and I am, believe it or not, the youngest of eight. So my mom had seven oops babies before she had me. <laughs> and then um, when I was about five or six years old, eventually we, um, you know, my mom, who was a single mom by that point, um, decided we need a better and brighter future. And so came over to the U.S., settled in Coachella Valley, and grew up in the rural areas of Coachella Valley, like Coachella and Thermal and Mecca and some other regions there. And um, let's see. So I think that the biggest challenge was being a single mom. Uh, my mom worked two jobs, manual labor, farm labor. Um, and so um, poverty, and, you know, and kind of growing up in apartments. And then um, I vividly remember being kicked out of one apartment and having to move somewhere else in the middle of the rain and um, trailer parks and that kind of thing. So there was then this lack of structure and guidance. And so when you're growing up like that, sometimes you tend to make poor choices, which I did. Um, ended up going to a continuation school out there, uh, La Familia High School. Um, but the never changing factor that really impacted my life was teachers who continue to just believe in me and push me and say, hey, you've, you've, got, you've got something special and keep at it and never give up. And uh, at some point, one of those teachers taught me how to play the guitar and I completely fell in love with music. And then um, years later, some others said, you should graduate and then you should try to go to college. And I got a million in, I, I got a one in a million shot to go to college after I graduated, met the love of my life there, and she's got to be hearing this because this is Valentine's Day. And so, um, this is set up for you, Frank. Yeah, Let's thank go. you. Yes, yes, thank you. And uh, she's in education as well. Um, we both, uh, we have four beautiful children, all adults now, officially, as of just a few weeks ago. And uh, one of my daughters is now a teacher. So it's just quite impacting how, you know, the, the circle and things just kind of come back to you know, people making a difference in my lives, and now me and my family working to make an impact in the lives of others. And obviously working in personnel, one of the things I try to do is make sure that we have the right people to make the right impact for students. And so I think that's it. Yeah. That's good. Um, I agree. I love all the commonalities and all the overlaps that you hear. Um, I was born in Barstow. Mm. Um, we'll just leave it there. <laughs> uh, my dad was a civil servant out at Yermo, and um, he broke horses, and he was a cowboy on the weekend, a civil servant in the, uh, during the week. I am second in the birth order, but I think I'm a little bit of the oldest sister as well, because there's 12 and a half years between my older sister and myself, and then my brother's three years younger. And there was a lot of heartbreak and disappointment in those 12 and a half years where they wanted a big family, and that just didn't happen. And then definitely oops uh, with two of us that came after that. So my sister's more like a second mom um, and I feel like I have older sister to my brother. Um, and I'm always interested when you hear people who have such deep roots in places because um, when I was eight my dad died and that creates a rolling stone kind of thing for a family very often when that happens and especially then. And so we had just moved so my dad could have more property to do the horse thing and then he passed away, and so that, then we just, my, I was a latchkey kid, my sister was in college because she's so much older, my brother and I, my mom trying to kind of keep it all together. Um, so that was a significant challenge at, at the time. But I, a silver lining um, was that my mom remarried an amazing man who raised us, and so, you know, I feel like stepfathers don't always get their due, but he was an amazing guy who really did right by our whole family and was, we were, she used to say, I got 50 years, I'll say this on anniversary, just took me two husbands to do it. So <laughs> she had that golden anniversary. Um, but for me, like Minnie said, uh, during that period in particular, teachers were my salvation and school was so important to me and it made such a difference um, that I really knew that I wanted to, I didn't know, let me rephrase that. I knew I loved it. I thought long and hard about being a teacher because my sister's 12 and a half years older and she was a teacher and I saw how hard, I was 12 and watched her start teaching and thought, oh, I'll never do that. But never say never, it was ended up being a, the best career I could have. So um, the last thing I'll say is just like uh, Dr. Komorowski, I ended up then moving a lot and ended up, my dad took, I left as did um, Miss Barkley 
in high school and finished my high school career in a boarding school in England because my parents went to the Middle East. My dad was retired Air Force, ended up working for aerospace. And so all those disruptions also can be great, but they're also challenging as you frame those new friendships and try to fit in. So um, hopefully you learned. Did you learn something about some of your colleagues and people at the dais? And I think you know one of the things, we get into a role. Um, Brene Brown talks about, you know, in different settings, we wear our suit of armor, right? It's what we wear to protect ourselves in a certain role. It's how we conduct ourselves in that role. And one of the hardest things is to share vulnerability, which is what you all just did amazingly. Um, and I always like to, there's a short clip, if you ever see it, of, of Dr. Brown, where she's getting ready to give a big talk on the importance in healthy organizations. She works with Fortune 500 companies around the world. Uh, the importance of this shared vulnerability. And she said there was an ASL an interpreter who said, what's a word you're gonna use that we really need to be able to know? And she said vulnerability. I'm gonna say it a hundred times, so you all need to be consistent on that sign. And so one of them said, oh, it's this. And like somebody's knees going out from underneath them. And she said, oh, no, no, that's not what I want. And the other interpreter said, oh, it's this. And that's exactly what it really is. When you're sharing vulnerability, you're sharing your heart and you're giving people an opportunity to not see you in that suit of armor as the board member, as the elected official, as a superintendent, as a cabinet member, but really as a human being who's bringing that full self to the work that you're engaging in. Anything else, colleague? All right. That was great. Learn, I mean, it's just always so interesting. We're all here, but we've all come from such different paths and different backgrounds and different life experiences. I'm gonna move us on to the next slide where we're gonna do a little bit more introspection. But now we're gonna really think a little bit more about our seats and our roles. I'm gonna read these to you, and I'm gonna ask you to think for a minute. Um, we're not gonna each share all of them, two to three that really jump out at you. Um, and let me just frame them for you because I don't want you to take them all too literally. So as you all sit here, and we're in 2023, we're gonna wrap up the 22-23 school year I am looking forward to, I am looking forward to meeting. If you're newer on the board, that might be something that there's somebody still in the organization I haven't met. If you're not, it might be somebody you're looking at reconnecting with or you know, reestablishing. It might be somebody that's new to the organization that you haven't really met yet. Um, this will be a source of inspiration to our district. Productive paranoia tells me I need to be a little worried about. Um, it's always a good thing to have in the back of your mind that thing that, you know, I'm look, why do I look at the fiscal person? Like just <laughs> instinctively as a superintendent. Um, that thing that you, you might be worried about. Um, the next one says, I want our community and staff to have these three takeaways from our second semester meetings. And so whether you're at the dais or, or whether you're thinking about other kinds of divisional and department meetings, what does that mean for you? And then finally, I am planning to find strength and resilience from or in, okay? So we're not gonna assign those to you. We'll have a little more free-flowing conversation. Let me just give you a couple minutes to start the ones that you wanna talk about and share, and then we'll jump in.
I don't want you to overthink this, so just a, another minute. <laughs> 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 Do you want us to jump in? I do, thank you. So I know for the new board members, especially Joe, I think he's gone to eight campuses and it's, it's been such a joy to hear the different experiences on the campuses that we've had. And I've only been to a couple and I've loved it. I've loved connecting with the principals, having those real discussions with teachers. Um, I did spend months and months in the neighborhoods and I think that was vitally important for stepping onto a board. Um, and I will continue to think about those things, but on the flip side, yes, I absolutely love the experiences that I've had so far and I'm grateful to the executive team for being with us, facilitating that and making sure we can continue to pursue it. I've also been appreciative of the emails coming, come to the choir festival or, you know, here's the different events. You can read a book and be a part of that. And I think, We've all got that work ethic where we want to put that time in, in a diverse way so that we're not relegated to one topic. You know, we, we're going to be diverse as we move on and I think time will prove that, so. Thank you. I'll share one or two. <laughs> um, the, I, I just need to be honest here because what I'm looking forward to is a couple of really boring board meetings <laughs> in the near future. Um, it's, it, there's been a lot going on. Um, one of the, um, the big things, the people that I'm looking forward to meeting, uh, continuing to meet staff, teachers, um, the people that make this district run, um, but what was really good for my heart and, uh, and this journey was getting to meet some of the students um, at the, the recent um, Student of the Month event, and hearing the, the stories and the obstacles that those kids have overcome, um, and then just the, the absolute amazing, um, I mean, we've got local heroes, we've got, uh, I, I mean, it's, it's amazing. I wanna meet more of those students and hear more of those stories and understand uh, you know, their experiences. So for me, that's. I'm with Danny. Oh, oh. Go you go. Thanks. Um, so, sorry, this font's really tiny on the paper. Um, I am looking forward to learning. Um, I love to learn. I love to, I always ask a ton of questions. And I don't know if everyone likes that about me, but that's the way I learned, and I really love to learn. I've been on the board for a little over a year, and I just feel like every meeting, every conversation, I just learned so much, and I, I'm really looking forward to just continuing that. This district is huge, and as board members, we are far from the experts. We never will be, and so it's fantastic to have such a supportive cabinet and so many teachers and so many people to learn from, so I really love that. Um, okay, sorry, I felt like I could squint through it. Um, <laughs> So I want our community and staff to have ta these takeaways. So um, one is that um, I'm really here to listen. I think that that's the most vital role that we have as board members um, is not really what we bring to the table, but what um, we can listen and learn and what we can do with that information. Um, all of us have lots of skills, I'm sure we have wonderful resumes, but um, I'm really here to listen and, and, and to work through um, any situations or questions that people have. I think that's my, my best role. I love when someone comes to me and says, can you help me? Here's a situation and I can guide them to the right person to handle that. That's super rewarding. I definitely don't have the answers, but um, another one I hope the community will, will understand is that, for, that from my perspective, students are a number one priority. They have to be. Um, there's a lot of competing interests, but no matter what we're doing, we need to go all the way back. I tell my staff at work, um, we have to ask ourselves five whys. So every time you have any situation, well, why? But why? And you go all the way back to the bottom, and I also work with kids, and it's always the kids. So we need to remember that as a board, go all the way to the end, and that the students are our number one priority. Um, and the other thing I'd love for the community to, um, to have as a takeaway is that we need in community involvement on so many levels. Um, in relation to the last one, finding strength and resilience, I read every single email. I 
think I reply to them all. I don't, maybe not, but I really try to. But all of the messages that people send me, um, I think are important. Whether they agree with me, they don't agree with me, they have a question, they have a situation. Every, every email is important and we need people to be involved. And there are so many ways. And I know there's many, many opportunities for people to be involved that they don't know about and there's committees where no parents are on so I think it's really important as we move forward with the board that we continue to help people who come to us that want to be involved guide them to a place where they can be involved and and help the community to know that that we are here to support them and their involvement in our district I'm looking forward to <clears throat> go into the schools as many times as I can um, and finding these hidden gems within the schools as as Barclay just mentioned the students absolutely I uh, went to a great Oak High School um, the very kind Enrique Lisa Jerry and Jim invited um, uh, me to their school and I got to see all the um, you know the music the color guard and there's a secret gem there's there um, the second half of the varsity and Steve you know this that 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 gem of a student, Ashley, who was playing the French horn. Oh my God! Yeah. I'm your fan for life, Ashley. So it's 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 um, situations like that that I can't wait to find myself in again the hidden gems, <clears throat> and uh, meeting as many people as I can. Finally, getting over to Mrs. Deus and learning all the mnemonics with Sped. <laughs> which I'm ready to push through it, and I feel like an idiot when I'm at the schools and like, and I'm just hearing all these mnemonics, but. <laughs> That's the learning curve that I can't wait to embrace. And then I think um, the source of inspiration to our district, all of us come to the table with depth and breadth. Um, for me, I didn't disclose, but one of the challenges with me is uh, being raised in a divorced family is really hard. Like my mom's full German, she still lives there. I, I've traveled back and forth. And so for me, there was trauma, behavioral problems in there. And I can relate to, and, and even being a professor to all my students, those students who struggle, live out of a car, single parent moms, violence in the home, drug use, whatever it is. And so for me, I often wonder like, why did God let me live a life like that with trauma as a kid and all this, you know, just no roots. And it's so that um, I could share that with the people I meet and with the students I encounter. Not that I'm direct, directly involved with students here, but like I said, I, I, I have you know many of them, but um, it gives me sentiment. Um, I'm, I'm sentimental. I like to hold on to things, and it was because of that um, growing up as a childhood. Um, I'm more prone to forgive, give, give people second chances, and that goes for um, students, staff here. So it, you know, I think that relates to team building and trust. Um, I'm here. I'm you know ready to learn, and I'm very forgiving, and. I'm open to forming these deep relationships over the next four years. Thanks. You guys don't leave too much room. <laughs> um, uh, one of the things that I always wanted to do is visit every school in the district, because I consider every school my school. And um, I have a folder on my desk. It's not like that. It's, it's about like that. And um, it's full of emails from parents and teachers like Kelly, who's sitting right there, Kelly Maxey, one of our great CTE teachers. And um, I do answer every email I get. I'm, I make it a point because I, I think it's irresponsible, no matter what someone reaches out to you, if you don't respond in, in a way, whether they like what you do or don't like what you do. So I've uh, tasked Jody and Lene to put me into every school in the district that I haven't been in starting tomorrow. Um, I, I think uh, when I think back to myself as a student, I was a pain in the butt. God, I was. I really was. I was so bored in school, literally from the time I started school till I graduated. Um, teachers always had me doing stuff like I was the office monitor or I ran the mimeograph machine or the rexograph machine, <laughs> or I rang the bells, or I ran the projector in the auditorium. Not that I was um, bad, I just was bored. And from the time I started school, I mean, I was always, we had these things called the Iowa tests. I don't mm -hmm. know if any of you remember. Mm -hmm. And I always got 99 on the Iowa test. And I would bring it home, my mother would say, why didn't you get 100? <laughs> 
I didn't know why I couldn't get 100, because nobody could get 100, because the highest you could get was 99. And so uh, when I retired and I moved out here and I played golf every day for 15 years and I worked at a golf course, finally I said, you know, I really need to do something else. Golf is fun. My, my son and my daughter are fun and my grandkids were born and they're fun. And then someone talked me into running for the board and I love it. My best thing is to go to schools. Joe and I were a Great Oak Saturday night for the Colored Guard and the percussion band and the marching band. I have a whole bunch of school visits. Um, we have amazing things. So the three things I want people to know about our district is our amazing CTE programs, the amazing excellence that our teachers provide, and the emotional support that they provide to our students. Those things are critical for a successful school district. Thank you. Can I add one more thing with sure. one point that we didn't make? I'm gonna do this one. So the productive paranoia tells me I need to be a little worried about, and I would say worried that we do need to get to that point of discussing how team building and all the good things that we take away today really correlate to some of the differences that we're gonna have. Um, I don't know how much you know about the campaign and the election, but um, there are some definite things that I think we need to make sure we speak to, because it's one thing to kind of get carried away with platitudes and, and um, kind of that surface conversation, which we need to do and respect and love one another, but then below the surface, you've got to get to the nitty gritty and say, so if we're going to move forward as a board and there's a decision where a majority has made that decision, how then do we, we respectfully deal with that, whether it's personally, whether it's in public. So I want to make sure we don't lose sight of the fact that within the love, we don't go to the true solution building and say, yeah, we got to talk about the reality of stuff that's gone down that's not right. And how can we get through that and still be able to look at each other and say, I'm proud of how I've handled this and I want to communicate to you clearly. And we may not see eye to eye and, and that's the way that's things okay. might be. Yeah. And I, so. I thank you for bringing that up. I think we're going to answer some of that, not all of it, but we've, you know, we go through the smart and healthy organization piece. We're going to talk again about why you still have to start here in order to get to those pieces that you're talking about. And then you have work coming up where you're going to go through your governance handbook. So what we're trying to do today primarily are two things to really give you the opportunity to sort of bridge that interpersonal piece with each other so that you have a little bit of connectivity and understanding of what people are bringing to those conversations. And then leave you with some thinking. We have a piece in here uh, called The Governance Mindset. Um, this is a book a lot of districts up and down around the country are, are working with. And, um, and it's a Michael Fullan Davis Campbell book. So we have a little piece from him that talks about this shift, you know, from the campaign trail to the governance work. And there's just a couple of nuggets in there that we hope will be food for thought as you go through these next pieces. And then after this, you're going to work on that what and how. Um, and here's what I want to say. It's, it's a journey. You never arrive. It's a process, and it will be iterative. Um, but what we hope is that as a board, as you work through these pieces over the co course of the first year together, because the first year is all that storming, norming, and forming until you have a sense of how you work as a body. And you work as a body. You are not five individual bosses. You are a body that works together to give direction to the superintendent, who then passes that on to staff. So. Um, it, it's a stutter step. It's not an easy, smooth transition, and now we've arrived and everything's going to roll out. But what you what you will need to arrive at are some agreements about exactly what you're saying. How do we going to how do we go through that? Have our rich and deep discussion. End up with a vote that may not be in unanimity, and go forward as a body to do the work of the district. And that's I know part of what you're going to be looking at in, shortly. Okay. So, so we're going to take. A break before we do that. See if cabinet has anything to add on this piece before we do that. Okay. Did you have any any leadership? Any uh, we used yoga because we thought it's meant to be stretching you a little, right? Working those muscles. Anything you wanted to share with your board superintendent or yeah? Let's go. Okay. Let's see. So uh, what am I looking forward to? I put helping to unite this board around a collective vision. So we've spent a lot of time getting to know one another individually and me kind of asking a lot of questions, trying to figure out your why and what you'd like to accomplish. But now it's up to us to 
at some point in the very near future, put that together into a collective vision. So that, that excites me. Um, what are some things, um, what would I like our community and staff to have uh, these three takeaways from second semester meetings? I wrote down, change is not a bad thing. Um, that there's always room for growth, even in a very high achieving district. We, we have not arrived, we're not done. There's always work and we see that every single day. Um, and then that no matter what, and I think Mr. Gonzalez, you kind of referenced this, our students continue to amaze us and just absolutely thrive. And so finding continued ways to celebrate that and bring attention to that, I think are critical. And then the last one, I am planning to find strength and resilience. Um, oh my gosh, these, these folks prop me up every day. And you're the reason I get up and keep coming back to do this over and over again. So they give me an amazing amount of strength and resilience. And then what gives me really the most, not to put you guys down at all, are the kids. Uh, just yesterday I walked in first thing in the morning to the kindergarten classroom and I, I sat down with a little one and I started to tear up and I said to the teacher, can I just stay here all day? <laughs> I, mean, I really did, I, I, I had to be dragged out. And so just that constant reminder of this is why we do what we do and making sure that we can all enjoy those moments is important. Okay, I'll just share one quick one. So I know everyone that sits around this table, this, this is a tough job, regardless of, of what our position is. Um, it's, it's hard, but I think I'm planning on finding strength and re resilience from understanding and recognizing my why every single day. And my why is kids. My why is the incredible instruction that happens in this district. So ensuring that I kind of fill my own bucket and my own reason why by visiting school sites and honoring the teachers who are doing the incredible work every single day um, to move our students forward. If I make sure that I'm coming back to my why and I'm internalizing it, what do I do? I bring it to my team and it just, it resonates and it reminds us what we're all about. And I think we get, we get busy and we get bogged down sometimes in other things and those other things are important. They need to happen. But always remembering our why and coming back to our why and that's where I get my strength and that's where I get my resilience from, um, especially during a time like COVID. I mean, that was hard and it was incredibly difficult on people. But at that time, I was leading the special education department and probably one of the biggest challenges of my entire career was how do you do this and how do you provide students during that time a level of support virtually. But I guided our team and we just remembered our why every single day. And um, in, in my humble opinion, uh, <laughs> we were successful, as successful as we could be during that time. So that for me is where I get strength and resilience. Mine is similar to yours. I'm looking forward to getting back to the work is what I wrote down. Um, we all had full plates and full-time jobs before our uh, careers were kind of hijacked during the pandemic and we've been pulled away from the work. There's been a lot of other things that um, we has sh shifted our attention and so getting back into classrooms, you know, and, and getting, we, I, all of us have never lost sight of that why, but how we met um, the needs of students changed drastically. And I'm just, we're finally getting our footing back underneath us. And I, I'm just really looking forward to getting back to the great work that we've been able to, to do and continue back in that same trajectory. Because I, I have a lot of pride in TVUSD. I think a lot of our students and staff do. And, being a product of this district, I'm a little biased, but you know, I'm just really excited to get back to the work. I am at the risk of sounding redundant for some of my um, ideas that have already been said, but I'm planning to find strength and resilience from our just incredible students, just their tenacity, um, what they teach us every day. They teach us more than we teach them, um, but also our staff who, I'm so blessed to work with and learn from every day. I find resilience and strength in a staff that look forward to coming to work every day because of what they get to provide our students and leave work every day wondering how they could have done it better. And that's who we work with every day. Um, I want our community and staff to have these three takeaways from our second semester meetings. And I'm wearing really my student support services hat in this that all means all and that we are student-centered. 
and that we use data to be solution driven in this district. All right, so productive paranoia. I think uh, <laughs> <laughs> the pandemic really taught us a lot of things and one of them is staffing shortages are a real thing. And so um, what I am constantly, I wouldn't define it as worried about, but what's constantly in my mind is how do we get ahead of it? How do we make sure that we are competitive, that we market, and it's got to do with marketing, it's got to do with re recruitment and those types of things, but also uh, being creative about ways to make sure that we attract and retain the best staff. So that's always at the forefront of my mind. And what I'm looking forward to is um, in the last couple of years, we've come up with ways to develop staff's capacity, whether it be HR 101 trainings for our new administrators or our brand new aspiring administrators academy. But I think there's more work that can be done. I think there are um, workshops and professional development in different areas um, for both classified and certificated staff. And I'm looking forward to working with my team to come up with ways to, to do that for our district. Nice, very good. So Thank we, you. So we will transition. Uh, before we take a break, though, one last thing I thought we yep. maybe finish okay. the slide and on the mixed case, please. And then I just want to first of all say, you know, if I were to record and, and, and kind of do a tally of some of the key words and concept of the previous exercise, it would be learning, teaching, and overwhelmingly students. And, you know, if, I, if you could see yourself when you talk about students, the way you've been modeled, I just want to. I just want to re-echo that to you and because that's true passion and, and, and that's, a, that's a really, really good thing to hear in that we're talking students and it's for all students within the school district. And I sense that commitment coming from all of you. So I just wanted to, to feed that back to you and, and I appreciate that. And one last thing I want to say, Ms. Wurzma, is absolutely because we're sitting at the table here and you'll see in a matter of scope and sequence that we're going to get deeper into some of the management and strategic thinking um, that we can maybe offer today and hopefully uh, down the road with a little bit more of, of, of opportunity there. But if you look at um, this picture um, you around you. you saved it for Stephen. I know, it. right? <laughs> so, so, you know, I'll tell you what, Stephen and I, we had a little bit of conversation. I actually signed up for, uh, to be a volunteer um, at the Torrey Pines, but COVID cut the volunteer staffing by nearly, I want to say more than half. Oh, yeah. So they put me on the waiting list. I forgot I was on the waiting list. Seven months ago, I get an email from the volunteer <laughs> coordinator says, congratulations, Michael. Uh, congratulations, what, what happened? <laughs> you have been selected to volunteer uh, at the US Open coming up in, in May. And I thought, wow, that's pretty cool, right? So I can't wait. So when this popped up, and obviously Steve and I have the conversation, but I want you to kind of quickly take a look at this before we go to break. And then again, this is going to lead into our thinking and transitioning into something that's more solid, tangible, strategic of the work that we're doing as a team, right? In the system, okay? But look at the simple picture um, for a moment. And I want you to tell me what jumps out at you. Uh, and I want you to think about it and pay attention to the detail of what you see. What are some of the things that jump out at you about what you see here? Who wants to verbalize it? Sure. Yeah. Absolutely, please. Jump in. When you think you know everything, you're like, I didn't know <laughs> that you use scissors to cut. Is that for a golf tournament? Yes, the night before. And that could be applied to our learning curve at, you know, right now as new board members, you know, integrating ourselves with staff and all that. So, I mean, you just don't have the whole picture. It's layers and layers and layers, you know. Well, well said. And I would even say thinking about scissors is something that jumped out at me also. But you would think about, you know, maybe trimmers, right? Because this is grass. But there's a reason they chose scissors. Because it's for the precision of the work that they're doing and the meticulous detail that they pay um, to the work that they do, right? And anything else jump out at you? Thank you for that. So that's exactly right, the scissors. Anything it, else? It's also notable that there's two. So... Mm. I think the teamwork in life, when you develop that system, you're usually more successful because you should never stay in an echo chamber. I truly believe you should have mentors and people that you work with side by side. So that's what I see. Well said. It's a team. It takes a team to, to get this thing done. Any, any, anything else from anybody? 
I mean, notice, I'll, 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 you don't, I'll, don't I'll say, it, 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 she kind of stole my point yeah. there because it, it, it was a, a team thing, but sometimes when you do a task that, that seems this minuscule, <laughs> you, you get bored, and it is nice to have allies, and it is mm -hmm. nice to have a relationship with people, because I'm sure they're joking about what they're doing. You're not so alone. <laughs> You're right. not in there by yourself. Well said. So. And I would say, God bless the people who are doing a job that I would never want to do. <laughs> <laughs> well said. Yes, sir. It's attention to detail. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Getting down to sometimes um, the smallest details are important to the overall success of the operation. And, and that is a huge piece. And in fact, look at what they're cutting with scissors, right? in how many holes and how many bunkers there is on the course. Imagine doing that for the entire course. So think about the strategy behind what they're doing and why they do what they do. Uh, thinking about uh, just the partnership that you mentioned, uh, Danny, and, and some of the, the morale that, that's generated from this teamwork and the supporting one another. And I think uh, we'll use that kind of as a segue, yep. Sandy. Sounds good. And we'll take uh, 10, minutes, 10 minutes. Since there's we'll a number of back. us. and. Uh, stretch, whatever you need to do, and we will come back at 5.35. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's great stuff, yeah. No, it's such good. So good. All right, thank you all for being so prompt. Appreciate that. All right, so we're gonna move on a little bit more into some of the, the content just to get you thinking about how this all comes together when you think about the foundations of a, what, what Lencioni calls a smart and healthy organization. And what he tells us in the book, The Five Dysfunctions of a Team, is uh, through a parable that Lots of organizations do well on that smart side of the house. They've got some strategy about how they're conducting their business, whether it's a corporate business, a social service, a K-12 technology. We're thinking about that, obviously, at a variety of levels. Focus on so fiscal solvency, boards, that's a huge part of your responsibility. Partnerships you know, within the community, with other organizations, and then marketing and branding. You, you can have all of those pieces, but his position and his research is that when you do not have the healthy side of the house, you still won't be successful. And so our attention, it's 
sometimes easier to give our attention to that smart side of the house because those are tangible things for the most part. They're easy to make a plan for, implement, uh, purchase, whatever it is that you need to do to implement them. But when you look at the healthy side of the organization, a healthy organization has minimal politics. And I think it's really important that you key in on the word minimal. It doesn't say no politics. It's not realistic in any kind of organization uh, around the globe. So there will be politics, but can the organization keep those minimal so that you're able then to do the work? There's minimal confusion. Mike's gonna talk about this in a, in a minute. But people know what they're doing. They know why they're doing it. They have an understanding of what that flow is. There is a hierarchy of how decision making happens. People know who to go to. You know, I think it was interesting that uh, Ms. Barkley mentioned that earlier, like I know who in the organization to send people to. That's a sign of minimal confusion. But if everybody's doing this, then the organization isn't healthy. Low turnover. Our friend Frank is thinking about that. Um, you know, in a healthy organization, people are not always calculating their next move. They stay for 25 years. Um, they stay, they come back after they've gone to school here. They want to be here. The turnover rate is low. Life happens. People move. I'm a mover. Um, you know, that's going to happen. You have people in your organization for a whole host of reasons who are going to move. But it should not be that everybody's looking for an escape valve because the unhealthy side of the organization is putting too much pressure on the folks in the organization. High productivity. Um, you can be busy and not productive because the conditions are not there for productivity. So are these other existing conditions in place, then you will see high productivity. And then finally, high morale. High morale is key. When people suffer from low morale, we know, you know there's been the term that I, I think we're not supposed to use in 2023, quiet quitting, right? This notion that people, though, are, are tired of a, an organization that doesn't think of them as people, that doesn't consider their interests, that isn't invested in building the organization overall. When we have that, people lose their investment and then the morale is, is low. And so high morale is a challenging thing to achieve. But when we focus on the right side of the organization, that morale is built. And so um, there's a little piece that he says here at the very beginning that I just wanted to read because I, it's just, this is the first paragraph of the introduction. Not finance, not strategy, not technology. It is teamwork that remains the ultimate competitive advantage, both because it is so powerful and so rare. And so when you think about the healthy side of the organization, it is all about teamwork. You can be on the smart side and you can have Nicole working on strategy and you can have Ed Services taking technology and, and, and Kimberly's doing that and then you can have Nicole working over here on the partnerships with um, non-public providers and Frank's worrying about the marketing and branding and that can all be well and good. But when the whole house isn't focused on that healthy side, they will do this and not re achieve the results and remember the pyramid from the beginning that you're trying to get to. So that's what Lencioni's trying to do in this work. And I just think reading that first paragraph is so important because it's not easy. It's rare, it's challenging, it's difficult. And to go back to Mrs. Ware's in the comment earlier, um, it's something that you will need to have as an iterative process. It is not something that, you know, it's a one and done and you've done it today and now everything will be uh, copacetic. You're gonna, this is something that healthy organizations plan for work through, revisit, and have an iterative process with the players who are part of that executive team. Any comments or questions about that before we? So Sandy, the mindset that you have just described um, in terms of- Your mic. It's on. You have it on mute though. It's okay. Okay. Can I hear you? Yeah, I think so. Okay. I think you're gonna go. So the mindset that you described um, earlier, Sandy, you know, again, it's, it has a lot to do with, you know, just kind of the, the, um, the function uh, and the health and of the organization um, in order to move forward. But I go back to what Ms. Orgema said earlier, well, what about the work itself, right? And so if you just go a little bit deeper, and I want uh, all of you to please take a look at uh, what's on the screen there. And, and, and don't go into the box just yet. Look at the, uh, the, the diagram behind me you see there are obviously a bunch of gears, right? And you see these gears are what 
connected, right? So the war and the concept of system and functioning as one is absolutely critical. And again, I think this speaks to then the good work that you do. But as Sandy has said earlier, the most important thing is teamwork. Without teamwork, these individual um, um, gears, they're just turning. And in the system, that's not efficient, that's not healthy, if you will. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you know, you, you know, in your, uh, you know, in your auto mechanic class, if you took courses like that, or even if you drive a car, from time to time you, you know that you need the tune-up on the engine, is because things are not sounding right. Some of the gears may not be turning as smoothly, maybe you need a little bit of oil job, but in order for the system to work function um, uh, efficiently, every single one of these gears has to turn. And if you look at all the divisions sitting across the table from you, they represent these gears and you represent the entire functioning system providing governance um, to this team. If you go into now what's inside the box, you're here to work coherence. And Sandy mentioned uh, the good work of Michael Follin. Michael Follin's work <coughs> about coherence is something that in my humble opinion, when I was thinking about um, going back in 2013, 2012, at that point, um, I don't think anybody's heard of the acronym um, LCFS. No, I think everybody can sleep and drink and eat that, right? <laughs> so that's some kind of funding formula. Again, I don't want to get all um, geeky on, on the budget because I have an expert sitting looking at me. <laughs> but you do remember revenue limit, and, and there's a different way of funding, right? And at the time, uh, the governor, the Governor Brown, says we need to look at a different um, funding model, an equity model, called the illegal control funding formula. But that's something that they're building into legislation, and that's going to impact public schools. But do you remember, at that point, there's another acronym you probably have never heard, LCAP, right? <laughs> now we live and breathe and, and, and sleep LCAP because LCAP wisely over time has evolved to become the system, the strategic plan, if you will, that we're working. And one of the things we'll get into a little bit later, if we have time, and certainly if not this meeting down the road, I'm hoping this governance team will definitely take a look at that, is do not allow, if. Um, redundancy to take place. In all the places I've been at and some of the people that I work with, they all have great intentions, but there's too many gears out there spinning freely and they're not connected. And what happens is that the system becomes very inefficient. So I want to go back to coherence just a little bit because the whole notion of coherence is working and understanding in the time of complexity, what do smart, team, what do smart teams do? In a time of complexity, Thank you, Danny. A smart team and smart leaders is at that point, at that time, that's critically important that you make simplicity out of complexity. Easier said than done. But this is where coherence comes into play. And if you think about all the different spots in terms of the work that you do at different times, in your journey on an everyday basis, even different divisions, you have to have alignment. It's only through alignment and coherence, as Michael Fullen will tell you, we can achieve the most efficient operation in any system, both private and public, and I argue, especially in public education, it is much more complex than even private. I used to work in the private sector. So we rely on people, we rely on teamwork, we rely on asking questions, we rely on vulnerability, we rely on each other, and be forgiving, as um, the uh, governor, um, governing board president I mentioned earlier, that that's critically important because at the end of the day, you know, your HR um, head will be able to uh, confirm that, I believe. Probably 85% of your budget in public education is in people. If you're in the private sector, you got research and development, you got material, you got all kinds of things for your budgetary needs. But in public education, it is all relational. Without people, without coherence, without alignment, things simply doesn't work efficiently. You guys are a very proud school district, as you should be. Long standing, high achieving, and everybody's looking at you. I know you want to keep this going for all of your kids, but to keep in mind, in order to do that, especially the next few years, you want to keep coherence and alignment in mind. And I challenge you to keep LCAP in mind, because that work right there is the proud work of all of the staff you have sitting before you, and those who are representing, probably watching on the screen, that's your teaching and certificated and classified staff. They need to hear from you that you understand in a time of complexity, you're going to find simplicity. We're going to do it through coherence and alignment. And finally, oh yes, they are watching. <laughs> Not only your local community, you know this, again for Temeco Valley, everybody's watching you because you've been doing some great work and we want to help you to continue to do that. Any, any thoughts? Andy? 
as we leave this slide, I think the other thing is that, you know, when, oh yes, they watch, one more thing we know about leadership is that it cascades, right? So when there's a coherent, aligned system at the top, that cascades and they watch, they see how are we able as a system to build out that so that we are showing, and it gets back to I think the discussion about how do we get to those difficult discussions and move forward. It really is that notion that, especially as a, for our elected officials, um, but now also for you know everybody, everything, is, there's no, nothing private anymore, right? Social media and televised <coughs> meetings and all that has changed how we interact as a boardroom. Mike and I were talking earlier about, you know, before we became superintendents, there was a time where, you know, information was meted out one little piece at a time because you, you had the luxury of doing that and not everybody knew everything. It's not the world we live in anymore. The world we live in now is an open book, an open hand, people know, make their own assumptions, make their own judgments. So it's just something that as we think about our system, if we could slice it in half and look at it, how does it cascade down? How do we see that whole system built out, the cogs uh, and wheels working together, and then how are we viewed by everybody who's looking at us as a system? This is just an anonymous quote from the book, and it, uh, I just think it sums up what you're all trying to do here today. When everyone in a system, no matter their official role or position, <laughs> shares the work of creating change, there is virtually no limit to what can be achieved. Um, and that's a challenge because it really, if top-down worked, we'd have a lot of evidence of that, but we don't have that, right? And if lack of leadership at the top worked, we'd have a lot of evidence of that. We don't have that either. It really is the both and. Strong leadership, strong leaders, as well as a staff and our employees who are committed and willing to share that work and be a part of that change and move that organization forward. Yes. Yeah, one point I wanted to make is earlier Dr. McClay talked about a collective vision between the board members and then tagging on to this coherence alignment. Um, one of the things that I find missing on the website and from a purely business perspective, we don't have a vision statement and I'd like to mm -hmm. emphasize that moving forward quickly that we get on a vision statement. Um, and then the mission and the values, which are priorities on our website and the vision's where we're going, the mission is how we're gonna get there and then the priorities are our DNA nuts and bolts. So for me, in order for all five elected board members and staff to, um, you know, going back to the system, an interconnected set of parts functioning to, to achieve a common goal, but what is it? If we have no vision statement, there is no common goal, and I think it really needs to be out there. So that's something that's missing that. And I think we might have a board shop in the future on that. Okay. Great. Thank you for bringing that up. Can I add one other aspect? I was thinking about the gears. Um, I know we've moved past that. The tough thing for me, and maybe you can speak to this with all of your wisdom and expertise, is because we're in an era with social media and people creating their own truth and an idea of what's happening, there's competing voices, whether it's different groups in the community who feel strongly one way or the other. There's um, the union piece where, you know, messages might be going out there, there's the board, and I think part of my frustration has been trying to figure out how do we really speak transparently to who we are, what we wanna do, and I think over time that will meet itself out, but we have newspapers, as you know, that might report something that's not accurate either, and that is a huge frustration for me because, you know, we, we, we wanna do great things, but there's so many facets there that go beyond the gears, even within the school. So can you offer anything to that or what you would see as advice or, it's tough. Uh, I'll jump in real quick and I think these are just things to, to consider, right? And number one, be a learning team and be vulnerable. What I mean by that is, and, and we talk about it, people are watching and, and that is you represent and you guys can make the school district to go from great good to great and, and that's a huge responsibility. But you don't, you don't get from good to great from day one to day three. It is a journey, right? And so understand that. And so I would say give yourself a little bit of a break, almost take the burden off of you and free yourself a little bit and understand that we're going to take steps. Build team first. We're going to trust this team. We're going to have a strategic plan. We're going to follow the strategic plan. When there are descending voices, you come back to the strategic plan. Again, I go back to the LCAP. The LCAP has laid out a legal process in which transparency is absolutely required. Your constituents, they all should give input. 
all the staff members who are behind building that plan and making it a reality in terms of execution has accountability built, built, built into that. What I find in, 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 in effective school district is that they use a strategic plan as their plan and everybody on board signs up to that. So when there's any questions, you go right back to the strategic plan which is the LCAP plan. If there's any disagreements or perhaps any um, thoughts of improvement, guess what? There's a transparent process for that. We welcome that input. So I just feel like when you have, again, complexity, and everybody's trying to tackle this complexity, because people come from good places with good intentions. There's no doubt about that. Others like they, they're spending the energy and time because they want to improve the system, right? But when you have already a system, don't need to create your own. You go back to the system, you let the system work for you, and that's a smart way to go. And again, I don't know if I answered your question, Mr. Wagsmar, but, but that's one thing I'll offer to you in a practical manner. And I do think there's a lot of noise out there, you know, and so as a board, as an elected official, that's a different challenge than it is for those of us who've, who've been staff, for sure. And in a minute, we're going to read a piece that really talks about shifting from the campaign mindset to the governance mindset. Um, and there is a shift there that, that, you know, you just have to go through because you get on, and I've had, I've worked with a number of boards over the years, and they've always said that was such a surprise um, if they weren't deeply embedded in the system or hadn't been a part of the system before that, you get on the board and there's all this stuff that's already done and in place and said, and when do we talk about that? And so that becomes part of your process for the board work, the vision setting, the strategic planning. Um, and I guess the, the, the simplest thing I will say is at some point as a board, um, you have to tune out some of that. And it's hard because you're, those are your people. I think you said it well earlier, all those voices matter, we care about it, but at the end, you are the only people who have the complete aerial view, and that's your job, to have that 30,000 foot view, to listen to all of those constituent voices, and to listen to your staff, and make those difficult decisions. No, I think we all agree that the focus of what we do, <clears throat> I think we all agree that the focus of what we do is the academic performance of our students and the excellence of the district. I think that's our focus, and I think everything else is extraneous. Anything we can do to make sure that we give our children the best that we can, that we have the best teachers, the best classified staff, the best everything is what we're here for, and everything else is extraneous. Um, I would add too, and just in my day job role, um, I can attest to strategic planning is so critical because once you have that strategic plan, it answers almost any question that comes forward to you. You know, in my world, it's like, oh, someone wants us to expand to another site. Should we do that or should we not? Let's consult our strategic plan. What have we decided? And when you formulate that strategic plan, it's made with tons of input from lots of different factions. Um, and I really think that what that creates is the buy-in from the top to the bottom. So as a board, our role is to um, have that big lens looking over, in my view, this is what it is, it's, it's looking over, um, not getting into the nitty gritty, but also ensuring that any decisions we make, listen to <coughs> everyone. So when we come in and make a decision, you know, without good vetting, without good discussion, that's when a lot of those voices bubble up and a lot of divisiveness. So um, I'm really a proponent for, um, you know, our district is not um, at risk of failure. We're not at risk of losing our funds. There's no critical need for massive change at the moment. So my personal tactic would be to to, to listen to the voices, explore, work as a team, gather ourselves together and, and looking at our strategic plan and deciding what's the best direction to steer this massive ship in a, in a slow moving way. And there are gonna be voices from every side all the time, all of our emails are full of them. And delete button's your friend, you know? You listen, you consider, but then at the end of the day, it's our responsibility to do what's the best for most in my view. I think the hard part here is that we know elections have results and consequences and when the community votes and 
there, there's some changes within a board. You have to be cognizant of the fact that change, you want to keep things simple, but there's going to be change. So I think it'll be great for us to move forward with respecting each other and figuring out that process. Because I don't know if you know our history, but it's been a little antagonistic for a while, if we're just being honest. Um, but I think if we can balance that knowing we have a big ship and, and we know you don't want to recreate everything from the beginning and yet leave facets of change because that is what constituents want on some level. But I know it's my personal goal to do that um, in a measured way and people might argue that hasn't happened up to this point, but like you said, only the person who's gone through a campaign and election process knows the history of what's there and then what they see in the current position. So that's the tough part for me is knowing we, we don't necessarily want to go along with what's always been because elections tend to bring different leaders to the forefront for a very important reason. But we need to do it more circumspectly and certainly respecting and looking for mentorship and advice at the same time. Like I would never want to negate that aspect. And so that's kind of the struggle that I think we're looking at. Ms. Wiersma, I, I, I appreciate what you're, you're saying and also um, Ms. Barclay because I think you're saying the same thing. The, the, the transitioning though is also critical, right? When you have an election season, you have to do what you have to do to get the job done. And so you can represent, but once the season's over, in order to become a very functioning board, that transition going from campaigning to operational, that is that growth as a board needs to take place. And I know Sandy has actually material that hopefully we'll, you know, we'll be able to dive we'll into just a little bit, because that's absolutely critical that. about that. And then the last thing I would add is a strategic plan. A strategic plan should be a living and breathing document. And so that's what, again, I go back to the LCAP. When you have wisdom behind good work that's put in place, you don't just yank out good work immediately and thinking the machine will continue to run. It won't. You got to do it strategically. But that does, again, involve the input from everyone, including constituencies. But if you go back to the LCAP, again, I always go back to the strategic plan. It's built in for that to take place. And the unified voice almost serves as a, I don't want to say a protective wall, but it really is what it is, that this is the, the kind of the arena we operate within legally, by the way, mm -hmm. that this is where we can do our best work together because there's that framework for that. Okay, so I wanted to say that um, before yeah. we move on to the next slide. Yeah, and I think, it, well, let's go ahead and advance okay. it. And while we're doing that, I will just say, you know, another great thing today is having cabinet here with you and your superintendent because this body is what's needed mm -hmm. as a body to make some of those changes and shifts over time. Um, you know, I used to always say to my board, if it was that easy, we'd have done it, you know, because th we work in a whole system of constraints and rules and regulations, and these are the folks who make sure that we're dotting our I's and crossing our T's. And, you know, what's important, and, and we've lived through this for years, what's important in, in November may not be important next November. And so you also, as the board, are always seeing, you know, where, where is staff coming from? Staff comes to you and you're looking at data, you're making data-driven decisions. But to Mike's point, you're looking at that LCAP, there are things that are not in there that still may be board direction setting, that then staff will work to carry that out. But I think to uh, Dr. Komorowski's point, it's about having that collective vision, and as Dr. McClay said earlier, that everybody's on board with that. You understand your LCAP, if there's a gap there, you're figuring out as a board, this is something important to us. So you're working with staff to make it happen. I wish we could do that and change happened. Um, systems are hard to move, hard to shift. But the good news is, as we've said earlier, you are a high functioning system mm -hmm. that's getting great outcomes for kids. And so uh, you're building on something that's already in a strong, strong place with a lot of committed folks. So that's the good news. Not every district is in that position. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, that's a huge credit to your system over time that it's been able to do that. Um, and you will continue, and I just keep saying this, it's a process. Um, there's another quote I'm going to read you guys in a minute from the book because it really reminds us that the speed of change and the speed of trust um, take some time. And so if you invest in that and you invest in each other as a board and as a team and really starting to, you know, work through what you can do, what you want to do, and how long it will take to get there. Um, I think then you're going to see those changes in the movement for your kids in the way you want to. I had a question to throw forward uh, as we move um, to be cognizant of the paradox that we face. On the one hand, we want to be a united board, 
But on the other hand, there's very real disagreement amongst the board members. Mm -hmm. and, and if we could find a way to exhaust that paradox, to function, to achieve a vision collectively, I'd be, I'd be grateful if and we could get to some of that. Because mm -hmm. that, that to me is the most real issue that we're looking at right now. And, and I will say, you know, I've worked with, like I said, a number of boards. Um, I've had some unanimity. I've always had differences with the boards that I've worked with. There, you're gonna have that. That's a normal tension of an elected body. And, and it's more heightened at the beginning. And there's a reason why we say Storman, Norman, and Foreman, because that is the natural way that groups of people, when they come together, organize. They storm at first, until the, and that's why this work that you're doing today is so important. Then they start to norm, how is this gonna work? And then you actually form to be crump, become the teamwork that you need to get the work done. I'm not saying it will be easy, there will be challenges, but I think to you know, really point to the president and superintendent here, the comments that you've both made about having some unified, agreed upon approaches, vision, strategy, that makes all the difference. And it doesn't mean that there won't be contrarians that say, I still don't like it, but you learn how to work forward as a board for the for overall. I, you know, I put your mission statement on the first second slide, high quality teaching and learning for all. So you want to create a bigger vision, an aspirational piece, but your mission is stated and you're very clear on that. And to Stephen's point, if we keep that front and center with everything that we do, um, you're gonna find the commonality and the common ground in order to do the work. All right. Okay. Yep. So the comment that was made earlier, and again, I appreciate that because it leads right into, um, I think we're gonna get into this exercise before we do that though, again, is understand and appreciate that going through a real change and when there's disagreement, but agree not to disagree, so we function as a team, and Dr. Norsky, what you had mentioned earlier, is you gotta have the trust though, right? Because on the day to day, we're still human. So when you go through bumps, um, only when you have trust, you're able to willing to forgive and able to move on. If you don't, what I see is just a lot of friction and a lot of division that results from that. And that's again the reason why we took so much time and Jody particularly had asked us to make sure you guys to put in time to do that. Obviously tonight, one night, one evening, in a couple of hours, we won't be able to do that, but at least we're starting that journey together. And as I said earlier at the start of, the, uh, uh, of our workshop, only you take away what you choose to take away. Mm -hmm. We're just facilitators. So keep in mind, though, that you guys are here for one thing, and one thing only, and that's abundantly clear. You guys are here for your community. You guys are here for the future of your community. That's your student. So to always keep that in mind. With that said, let's move on to the healthy organizations, and I have a quick exercise for you, because we are going to uh, hopefully uh, get to the notion of trust, and not just talking about trust, but make it a little bit actionable. And if you will indulge me, we'll go through the exercise. But before we do that, again, if you take a look at um, the circle um, and the four quadrants, number one says to build a cohesive leadership team, right? So we're beginning to dive into that a little bit. Uh, we're doing a lot of work on trust building. That's a major component of number one. Um, and you take a look at number two, moving clockwise, is to create clarity. Along the way, we talked about coherence, we talked about alignment, we talked about strategic planning, because if you are clear what you guys are here to do with the right mission and vision statement and the strategic plan, you know what naturally happens? Those who watch you in your community will see and understand and believe that our governance team for our very beloved and high-performing school district will continue. Because you know why? I trust them. I watch them, they're coherent, they're together, they function as a team, and they're proud. Yes, they have disagreements, who doesn't? But they work together, and they work through the disagreements smartly, and they do it cohesively, they will build trust. If they trust you, it's because you trust yourselves, okay? So clarity is very, very important, and you continue to keep that in mind, as Sandy has said earlier, Things may be clear today, but other issues will come to the table and make it muddy. You continue to work at that. That's where you go three, is to over -communicate, communicate clarity. And you're gonna continue to do that and you're gonna continue to reinforce clarity. But I can't emphasize enough that once you are clear, the regular folks, I call them, if you will, these are parents. These are parents and family to your, kid, to your children in the school district. 
we owe it to them to communicate that clarity. Because the more you communicate, you can never over communicate, the more understanding they will have. And guess what? Naturally, they will, they will rally behind you um, because they understand where you're going. Okay? So again, clarity is absolutely critical. I'll pause there for a moment before we jump into um, our exercise. Thoughts? I've got one. Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> I think um, I, I, I think you hit the nail on the head. Um, I think that the, the clarity actually has been contributing a lot to to, to some of the distrust that we have. Mm -hmm. um, it's a very new system. It's very new. Uh, we actually, I, I mean, in total, I think we have a little over three years of, of actual board experience on our entire mm -hmm. board. Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. Um, it is very new. Um, I, I, I know that Mr. Arce and I have been, been working recently on clarifying things and just mm -hmm. understanding the process um, with a new environment, with the heightened political kind of climate that we find ourselves in. It's easy to fill in the blanks, right? And, and immediately your mind jumps to, well, okay, is there somebody out to get me? Why is this process so complicated? Well, we that's, that's stepping out of construction and into mm -hmm. the public school system. And, and understanding that. So I think clarity and understanding and, and working out these processes and all those things will help and go a long way. So I'm glad you brought that up. Well said. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> if I could, um, I think that we all, all of us, uh, come from different points of view, uh, different experiences. Um, I was in education my whole life. I know what goes on in schools. I know what a good school is, I know what a bad school is, I know what a good teacher is, and I know what a bad, and it doesn't take more than five minutes for me to know. Um, the fact that we're elected is irrelevant to the job that we have to do as board members. We're not passing legislation. We're not voting on uh, immigration reform. As far as I'm concerned, we have one job, and that's the children in this district. And if we bring other uh, personal, political, or personal views into that interfere with that, we're not doing what we're supposed to do. And that's where I come from. And when I say we have one focus, and that's the kids, that's it. That's what I'm here for. I'm not interested in anything else that's outside of that. So as a caveat to that, I would say you do have to remember the fact that I think we do all have that underlying love for students and want to see the best for them, but you can't separate the fact that maybe passing a resolution about critical race theory is maybe what I would feel would be best protecting a student because I don't want them to feel like their skin color puts them in a box where all things are determined by that. They're so much greater. So I'm only bringing this in as an example because I do care about our kids and their education, but I may see that differently from Mr. Swartz, which is okay, right? But you're still gonna have those issues when it comes to passing policy or changes um, that you may just never see eye to eye on. So again, I think it's, coming back to how do we work through that in a respectful way, you know, because I, the kids are my number one focus, but to me, that's so important, but he may see it differently and that's okay. It again, goes back to the notion of agree to disagree and in order to do that successfully as a team, you have to have deep trust. And again, I, I wanna come back to our focus and it's gonna take time to do that and the willingness to accept that it's gonna take time to build trust. Um, with can, that, if can, you were, I'm sorry, can I just it, interject one more thing? Absolutely, yes. Um, I mean, just to sp speak plainly here, I think one of the issues is that there is not trust. I don't know how we're going to gain that personally. Um, I mean, I'm totally open to all of these exercises. I've studied this work ex <laughs> quite a bit in my work with Boys and Girls Clubs. I've been through many, many leadership certification, so it's all extremely familiar to me. But you're exactly right that it comes back to trust. And when there's um, things happening, conversations happening, plans happening where we're not informed about, where we don't understand the process behind it, where there's no um, clarity on it, there's, there's none. And 
it just has built in a very short time a lot of distrust. Mm -hmm. I personally am naively trusting, <laughs> probably to a fault, as many of my staff would, would attest to. I always believe people have the best intentions. I always believe that until they prove me wrong. And I am falling into that place now. And it is going to be really hard for me to move past that because there hasn't been honesty and clarity at all. And so, um, and while I definitely can agree to disagree, Danny and I have had many conversations and it's been super productive. And we do agree to disagree on quite a few things. However, we can have those conversations. And I have never found anything Danny has said to me to be misleading or false or dishonest in any way. Um, and that's why I think I can have those conversations with him. But, you know, other conversations, I don't, I don't get those. I don't get return emails. I don't get return phone calls. I don't get information. And so I don't know how to move past that until, you know, people are being honest. And I think so part that's of that stand. Sorry. I think part of the paralysis is too, is we're learning. So with the Brown Act, there's things you can or can't do. And we were so careful in some ways to, to, to do what we needed to do with our due diligence there. But then, you know, as other meetings rolled out, we've been accused of other things. And it's really tough because we're trying to do what's right and be transparent and we do need to build relationships. And I felt like at the last meeting, we did have a chance to agree on some things that we passed. And that was such a great feeling to me. And, uh, coming off of a campaign, it is hard because you, you, you get in a certain rhythm. And I know Allison in particular, we mentioned getting together and doing coffee and I'd like to, but, but it's really not gonna be an easy thing to build trust. And I think in the last meeting, you probably assumed that we did the worst thing and we, we didn't. <laughs> and so there's that frustration Agreed on our disagree. part. <laughs> right, but, and that's what's difficult is I, I don't know how we could convince you otherwise, and we're always trying to abide by the rules and the things that we're learning. And so, and we have you know. we can have advice. That's why that's why we have advice. So mm -hmm. if we want to have conversations and we're not sure if we can, we have people to give us that advice. Right. And we so we don't have to operate in that vacuum of just telling us nothing. And and honestly, I mean. I just, it, it's the motivation. It's the questioning, the motivation. And it's, you're right, it's not gonna be cleared up until it's proven because night one, yeah, exactly. total distrust. Yeah, so um, how I have a hard time, I'm sorry, you two are probably like, what have we gotten ourselves into? You know, I, I apologize, but well, I, I'd like I'm to just make being a honest, I, Mr. Schwartz. I don't really know how else to, to uh, say it, but as of night one, that's where the distrust was formed and then it hasn't been rectified. It hasn't been repaired. I, I made it my business uh, to talk to Danny before the first meeting. We shared with each other a little bit about each other. Uh, I met with you. We had coffee. And I have to say, when we had the first meeting, I made a suggestion that the board president should actually be someone who has experience on the board. And I was bulldozed out of that and bulldozed into two resolutions none of which were discussed with anyone on the board who was on the board before you came and put them into practice. And you just went ahead and bulldozed them through. That's, if you have a political agenda, that's not what I'm here for. I am not here for my constituents telling me what their politics are. That's irrelevant to education. Just like what you said about critical race theory. You know we don't teach critical race theory here. You know it's not part of the curriculum. Yet for some reason you felt it was the first thing you had to do to pass a resolution against critical race theory. That engendered distrust among our students and our staff. We had students walking out of school because of it. And that's on you guys. I'm sorry, that's on you guys. Thank you. It's getting a little heated. And I just want to go right back to uh, what Michael and um, S Sandy are trying to provide. They're going to bring in gears for us. And one of the gears that I see missing is the benefit of the doubt, Mrs. Barclay. You did not give us the benefit of the doubt. 
One thing that's gonna help us in the governing handbook on February 21st is validating points that each board member makes. Both of you just invalidated the majority of the board's decision. That goes against the governing handbook. So when these gears get set in place, I would urge you and I hope that you might respect the rules of the governing handbook so that even when you disagree, even then, we act as a unified voice. Um, if you, you don't mind, like Mr. It, Schwartz, it, I'm Mr. Sorry, Mr. Schwartz, if you go don't ahead. mind, please. please. go ahead. Okay, because it, it, this did kind of take a, a little bit of a turn and um, I, I think that maybe I can speak to, to, to the two of you a little bit different than that conversation because um, I, I have gone to great lengths to establish a rapport, to, to, to build that trust with, with everybody on this board, everybody I believe in the cabinet, um, regardless of what we disagree on. And because of us getting pulled into these types of conversations where our voices get raised, listen, I've been guilty of it too, right? Mr. Clown Factory, I don't have my t-shirt yet, but, <laughs> right? And we've all been guilty of, of maybe speaking from the heart and, and, and letting our emotions get the best of us. But when we sit in a meeting and we've gone through, you know, now the last 60 days or whatever it's been of trying to build that level of trust, which I think we have built a, a relationship that we can continue to build on. When I'm, when I'm accused of a misdemeanor criminal offense in a board meeting without being given any of that kind of, of benefit of that relationship that we've built, that, I mean, that, that sets back any of this building that we've done all the way back, right? And what I wanna see and what I wanna see from all of us moving forward is as we make these gains and we build this rapport and we're able to have conversations with each other, that we don't just tear that down in a moment of, of, of passion or, or, or being you know, upset about a particular issue, we, we try to remember that we're gonna get through this issue. Tomorrow we still have to pick up and, and move the ball further down the, down the field. So I, I just wanted to, to you know, address that specifically because it, it was hurtful, I will say. It, it was hurtful just because I believe that we have established that relationship and I felt like maybe I, I misread the situation. We didn't have that rapport, right? Mm -hmm. Similar to Mr. Schwartz, when, when, you, when you get animated and you, and you raise your voice that way, it, it seems to only be in these meetings and behind the microphone when we can talk about these things. We can have these conversations very civilly. We seem to, to have a normal discourse. So I, I want to see this board move forward and to get over some of this hurt and some of this distrust. So I don't want to see us regress in this, in this setting. We're here to build on, on this relationship. So I'll just well leave said. it there. Well, just, I'm sorry, I do just have to, because I've been, I've been wondering if you would feel that way about, about that, because I didn't want you to. And what you're referring to, I did mull it over for quite a while when I realized what had happened. But that was my only recourse was to bring it up prior to a vote so that it would not have been an issue. Because right then, if we had stopped, there would be no violation. It would be done. So that was my point, is I didn't put all of that together until the day of the board meeting and realize that this is what's happened and we definitely should not proceed because it is a violation. So it was definitely not, and I do apologize if you felt like I was, because I thought you might. Yeah. <laughs> and I did feel bad about that because I don't want you to feel like I, I did that in violation of any conversation that we had had or any trust that we had built. But as a board member, I did not feel like I could let that go once that came to my attention. It, it's my duty. To, I, and to I bring understand. that forward. And, and I don't, I don't want to discount any of your feelings about the specific issue because I just, I don't think tonight is to, to go into the specifics of those issues. We'll have that opportunity soon. Yes. I want you to understand where we're coming from as people first. Let's build that rapport, all of us together, and then let's talk about those issues coming from a place of, of, an un, of understanding. You know, we're, we're, we're all good people. We're all honest Agreed. people. Agreed. I feel that way about everybody sitting around me. This, this desk. I don't feel like anybody is out to get me in, in some way. And we need to all get to that place so that when we have these conversations, we're doing it in a constructive way. Right? Yes, so and, that's, that's and as I'm a doing. reminder, I did give you benefit of the doubt. I reached out to you and you and you before the first meeting multiple times to sit down and talk. Because again, I believe everyone's coming from a good place until you prove me wrong. So I did reach, reach out and try to do that before our first board meeting. 
And I hate to keep bringing that up, but you know, when you're telling me that I didn't give you the benefit of the doubt, I did. I tried to talk to everyone, and, and I am trying to build that consensus. Uh, you know, as a leader in my everyday job, that's what I do all day long. You know, I have to do that with my staff. Everyone has such different opinions, and we all have to come together and get buy-in. And I feel like we can do that here, but it's not just words, it's our actions. So we need to work together, and please, let's have a boring more board meeting where we can have more things where we agree on and not try to, you know, we, we, all, we all hear from people what, what they want to have happen in the district, but we have to come together as a board and do what as a group we feel is best. And I, I'm sorry, we'll never agree with the, with this, with the um, CRT resolution. And you, I know what it says in the board policy, but it's, it's never gonna happen, so. Yeah, so one of the things, I'm hearing what you're saying, but I'm still having a problem understanding. When I give somebody the benefit of the doubt, I might ask clarifying questions. Hey, did you mean this by that? Hey, did you mean, like, to get more information before I bring a judgment forward? You were in the accusatory in the last board meeting. You did not ask clarifying questions. You, you asked very simple ones. Did I, did, you know, Mrs. Wearsmith talk to Mr. Renner? Did Danny? And then you said, oh, this looks like a brown. That was a very premature judgment you made in the accusatory. And I'm having a hard time understanding how you were giving us the benefit of the doubt when you didn't ask any clarifying questions. So yes, indeed, actions do matter. Because and I don't think we're going to resolve to the resolve same person this is a no, because, is, because clearly, well, if this will come out, you actually are wrong when you accused us of the Brown Act. And it's going to cost legally. It's going to cost financially. That will come out. So my, well, my, what we'll I'm see. trying to impart to you I is when we'll you see. say that you're giving us the benefit of the doubt, actions matter. Your actions were not like that in the last meeting. Well, I would disagree with that. I was bringing forward what I was doing as my duty as a board member when a perceived violation took place, I had no other recourse but to bring that to the public, which is where all conversations should have taken place. You had another place. recourse asking more clarifying questions before you accused us legally of a possible misdemeanor. I'm I sorry. Said, I'm trying I said, I feel to bring like this looks here. like a Brown Act violation, therefore we should not vote on this. That was what I said. So I'm gonna bring us back um, because I think, and, and you know, this is the reality. This is what governing in 2023 is like. There are a lot of strongly held beliefs, positions that are brought forward. It is challenging. It's always been challenging, let's be real. Being on an elected uh, body, and especially at a school board where we're responsible for people's children, is always fraught with emotion and um, all kinds of issues. That being said, this is a sticky, thorny piece that you are all going to have to figure out how you go forward. And I'm gonna bring us back to, because so much of what you're doing right now is part of this. And your challenge is you do your work in public. It is a challenge. The Brown Act requires it. It's the sunshine law because what we do as elected officials needs to be given the light of the day. Um, and so that makes for stilted conversations. It makes it awkward to get the work done that you need. That's why these workshops are things that high functioning boards do engage in periodically throughout a year because stuff can bubble up that's not agendized in the same way. It's about your governance work, which is agendized, but it's not about a specific topic. Um, you're gonna have to be very, I'm just gonna say it, very committed to both actions and words going forward. Words matter. Actions matter. The two together <laughs> are extremely powerful, and so you know what you've what you've brought to light today is, um, and I go back to why these trust pieces are so important. Um, the more we know about people, the more willing we are to broach and ask that question. Um, the more willing we are to understand how to approach a question. Right, all those nuances are built on that interpersonal relational piece, and so when we don't have that. It's easy to assume all kinds of things about intent and um, motive. And so you're gonna have, and I'll let, I'm gonna turn this, I think you wanna finish with, we'll touch on the other piece, but we're getting close to, this takes up, take oh, us to the quick. end. Okay, yeah, we'll, we'll do a little quicker. Um, but a commitment to this and doing what you're doing right now, which is saying, this is how I felt, this is what it was, I gotta confront the brutal facts, I gotta tell you the truth. All of those pieces are part of, I'll just hand it off to my colleague, yeah, absolutely building trust. Send, send that. And I think, I just wanna say one thing before we start this exercise, because it gives you an opportunity um, to go through an example and to make um, your trusting concept into action. Okay, that's what this exercise will do. But you know, I, I listened to the, uh, the dialogue, 
I'll tell you, I, I try to look for um, always the positive out of a situation that seemingly is not so positive. I can write down a list of things that I actually said mm -hmm. that I found positive. Mm -hmm. Number one, you guys were open about what you felt, okay? Because one of the things we're gonna talk about is talk straight. Again, I'm not getting into the exercise yet, but that's number one, speak your mind. Otherwise, I don't know what you really mean. Say what you mean, mean what you say. I saw that taking place, mm -hmm. Andy. Yep. Number two, I saw moments of vulnerability. I saw Danny going in and talking about the conversation you had is because I wanna reach out to you. We could disagree and understand that the issue is dis disagreeable. I may never change my mind, but I still respect you. I want you to understand that I'm hard on the issue, but I'm not hard on you. There's gonna be a lot of times that's gonna happen, and it's okay. That's why it's a five vote, uh, bore uh, situation, and sometimes the way it works in democracy is really messy. There's nothing wrong with 4-1, I'll say, at least in my humble opinion. There's nothing wrong with 3-2, because that's what the system's built to do to solve a situation that could be very disagreeable, depending on you know your philosophy and things of that nature, and your constituency that you represent. That's what democracy is all about. But to go through what the, what, the, what you guys uh, went through in terms of an exchange in public, um, I found a lot of positive out of it. I actually think it's a very nice first step moving forward towards building trust. I just want to leave that there for you guys, and it's actually a compliment to you to be able to face that and be able to talk out your differences and appreciate the strength behind that and to see it for what it is and we could get better at, at continue to build that trust. And with that said, uh, you do indulge me. I'm gonna try to do a shorter version so sure. we can conclude, Sandy, with your, um, your governance piece. And this is a copy um, handout um, that says Speed of Trust from Stephen Covey, um, 2006. Again, as I said, there's 13 components in um, the actionable items that we're looking at. Um, and the exercise here is to rather just talk about trust we're gonna make it actionable, okay? And, and, and so what I'd like for you guys to do, and just in the interest of time, we're not gonna go through all of them, but I'm gonna give you an example, and I'm gonna give you maybe five minutes to kind of have you go over it yourself. And, and this is what I'm looking for before I give you my example, okay? So you're gonna take a look at these 13 actionable um, items that's on this sheet. And you're gonna pick maybe one or two that, that resonate the most with you whatever that means to you, okay? And then you're gonna turn that particular actionable item into the I will statement, because this is about you. Trust begins with you. If you, I'll give you an example, um, and then we, if we have time, we can share it out. So I'll give you an example. Um, one of my top, when I was going through this, and it just came to mind, I will probably pick number four, for me, personally, right or wrong. I make mistakes, and I'll give you a specific example. In negotiation back in 2008, if my CBO is watching, she'll say, yep, I remember that clearly. <laughs> we sat down, went through some numbers. It was myself, I was in charge of human resources, and our CBO were meeting with the, with the teacher association. Um, and then we went through the numbers, and this is not negotiating away from the table, this is sharing information, right? And when the conversation ended, we were feeling pretty good because I felt like you know we were transparent about what we did, and they walked away, uh, maybe hopefully accepting um, the data we share with them. So that's a, a good meeting, okay? Two minutes later after the meeting ended, the administrative director who actually ran these numbers came in and said, we're so-and-so, the meeting just ended. I gotta tell you, I miscalculated. That number should be this number. And guess what? It's in favor, if you will, of the district, meaning there's a surplus to what we were talking about, okay? So what do you think we did? Let it go? Because the meeting ended, okay, right? Uh-uh. We call the union president immediately. We said, have you got off the parking lot yet? No, I just walked out, Michael. Come on back. This is something I need to share with you. We went to the office of the CBO. We sat down, and we flat out said, that number we gave you, it's not correct. We just got the information, and I need to give you that correct information. Whatever we do with that information, we'll move forward together, but I owe it to you to give you the right information without being asked, without being asked. And I think if you think about Stephen Covey, um, the depositing people's emotional bank account concept, most of you may have heard, I'd like to add one more piece to that as a building trust. When you deposit the people's emotional bank account, don't do it because you expect something in return. Do it because you don't expect anything in return. That kind of deposit in people's emotional bank account is a genuine deposit. People remember that. So when you run into conflict, that will come back to you twofold. Okay. 
So with that said, uh, I'm going to give you five minutes. Some of you started reading and writing already. If you would indulge me, please. Scan through these 13. Pick one that resonates the most with you and turn that into an actionable statement for you. You should say something like, I will, dot, 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 dot. And if we have time, maybe we can do a quick share out. As you're thinking about writing the I will statement, be as specific as you can. Because it's something that if we were to go through this exercise and have a follow-up, we want to come back and say, you said you would do this to build trust. With whom did you do that? We want to make sure that that's actionable for you. 